<laughs> you cleared your throat right as we were starting. TikTok, time to rock. <laughs> good evening, good morning, good, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all over the world. I'm your friendly neighborhood philosopher, and with me now is my wokest friend. <laughs> Actually, Carlton might, Carlton might have you beat, man. Carlton goes around like... like no, I think he does, man. Carlton's no joke, bro. He, he might he might got me on he might have me on that one man I'm, you know I don't, I don't know Carl hey shout out to Carl he's probably in the chat right now isn't he <laughs> if he's not he's slacking yeah is is, is Carlton here <laughs> oh you might need to turn that down yeah 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 oh, I'm having a problem on my computer right now I don't know if that's on my comp well I don't know if that's on my computer or uh do you see us. Yeah, I can see it right now. I'm looking at it right now. Okay, okay, okay. That's on my that's on my computer. No, whenever I shut down, uh, dang it, whenever I shut down this program called Joxta, uh, yeah, if I if I have a video pulled up, then it won't uh, it won't show the video. So I have to actually shut down Google Google Chrome, which I'm using, and then start it back up. No idea why it does that. But, Jocks, uh, is that a isn't that that, that program that, that gets everybody's social security numbers who's in the chat? Isn't that what the, isn't that what that does? Or? No, no, no. It's a, no, <laughs> Jock. You 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 might actually find it handy. Steals Although, there, there there are tons of programs to do the same thing. Jox is what I use to download a video. Like if I wanna if I wanna download a video and get a video clip, I use that. But oh, for God, some yeah. reason, every time I use it after I shut it down, um, if I try to watch a video, it won't work. And so yeah, I didn't know that, I didn't know it did that with live streams as well. But my live stream was just blank. So anyway. Long right. story short, Adam Coleman, my wokest friend, apart from Carlton, who who just walks around, give me my reparations. <laughs> I'm the second. I'm the second one. I'm like, give me my reparations later. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? In, in, in a few, in a few minutes. You know. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, all right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Adam isn't just one of my wokest friends. He's my only friend who at, he's my only friend who actually watches sports. And that's just <laughs> that's just I mean it's kind of sad, right? Cuz <laughs> Wait, who are your friends? Man, your friends are lame, bro. Is, is they are. They are. They're totally lame. Well, so you'll have like Sam and Anthony and they'll watch like MMA or something like that. But they don't watch football, they don't watch basketball, they don't watch oh, right, they, right, don't, right, they right. don't watch anything, right? So that so yeah, my my friends either it's like MMA, boxing, or, or nothing, right? Like Vocab. Nothing. Vocab doesn't watch any sports. Uh, John McRae, he, he, he he's don't watch on the any come sports. Up. Vocab he? is on the come up with the NBA, man. Like we we've been talking about the NBA lately. He, he's uh he's on the come up right now. Okay, yeah. Well, I mean, he he used to play like back in back in school and stuff, but right, right. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's no, uh, there's no hope for John. I can't help you with John. No, he yeah. just he just he just doesn't care. So yeah, um, yeah. no sports fans, and uh, so that leaves that leaves us to solve the world's problems. So, I, so I just want to take note that so I'm, I'm actually I wasn't invited on this episode here because I have something meaningful to say. It's just I'm the only guy that you're the only one to go to. You're the only one to go to <laughs> by by default. You know? No, and, and there there is there is a reason. I know that some of what you'll say will annoy a lot of people. And sometimes I think people need to get annoyed. Right. <laughs> right so right. Right. People, oh, absolutely. people don't get part part of the reason, not the whole reason, but part of the reason I go after Islam so hard is that Islam doesn't deal with any sort of disagreement or dissent very well. And so I believe it's got to be like a kind of crash course, right? Mm. Um, it, you got to, you got to, you got to go through a crash course until you get used to hearing stuff and not freaking out about it. Right. But right now, culturally, everyone is so sensitive. Anyone say, if they're on one yeah, side and you used to even mention, you even mention, like, like if, uh, if, if I, I can, <laughs> if, let me, let me, let me say this. If someone says some conservative said something, like, oh, yeah. he said this. And I go, actually, that's not what he said. What he said was, and it's just straightforward. Hey, I'm, I'm correcting you on this. Then right. it's, oh, ah! <laughs> you're Donald Trump's biggest fan trying to ramble. No, you <laughs> right. said something false and I'm, I'm correcting. And the same thing in the other direction. If I say any, anything remotely resembling, uh, I don't know. I've had a couple bad experiences with cops. It didn't have anything to do with me breaking the law. Ah! You're, you're a social justice warrior. Black lives matter. Blah 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 blah. Right? And it's like, uh, right, right. So anyway, so I, 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 I know you're gonna say some things that annoy some people. But guess what? We all, we all need to hear things. We all oh no, no. Hear, I mean, we all need to hear some too, things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's like you, if you can be. It, it, sometimes the charge is not that you're not conservative. 
but that you're not conservative enough or that yeah, you're yeah. not woke is that you're not woke enough like yeah, as yeah. in if you don't meet my standard of what it means to be a conservative like as in you just kind of toe the line you know frontwards and backwards then oh no no i'm taking your conservative card or mm -hmm. if you don't feel that every single case that involves a white officer and a black person is is racist then oh no no man it's, it's either you ride or die you know mm -hmm. like it's, it's, it's all or nothing and and my thing is like for me i i want to be i don't want to put content out that's not defensible you know what i'm mm -hmm. saying like i, I don't want to say stuff just because it's going to offend you know it's not going to offend people that you know are, are my you know viewers here but no I'm, i want to speak the truth mm -hmm. i want to be i want to pursue the truth and you know it's it's just nowadays man truth and nuance aren't really valued like they ought to be mm -hmm. that's just the reality of it. yeah and so uh, and actually studies have shown that things are for several decades now, things have been getting r rapidly polarized, right? Like you can actually look at like visual charts at how people used to be like, you had a line, you know, left, right and stuff like that, but people were pretty lumped together, you know, in, oh, yeah. around that, around that line. And then you had, you know, fringe people, fringe groups were, were way off on one side or the other. Whereas now there's like one massive group over here and one massive group over there. And then, and then some people, uh, right, in the center, right. but there, there was a, there was a, um, there was a study on the, the political divide, like in Congress and so on and, and how they, you know, how, how one-sided the, the different, the different parties and so on are. Mm -hmm. And the, the record for polarization, the most the most polarized since it's uh, since records have been uh, available on this since the early 1900s, the most mm -hmm. polarized was uh, recently um, during the administration of Donald Trump. The previous record was set earlier in the administration of Donald Trump. The that broke the record that was set during the administration of Obama. Mm, that wow. that broke the record, the polarization record that was set during George W. Bush, which broke the record that was set during the administration of Bill Clinton. What that means is wow. each new administration wow. is breaking all records of of political polarization. Right. Which means people are just becoming, I mean, far, far, you know, far away from each other. So the right, situation right. is if if you're far enough right, then as, as you're talking about, you know, you, you can be. It's not that you're not conservative, it's that you're not conservative enough, or it's not that you're not woke or left or whatever, it's that you're not yeah. far enough. But basically, if you're far enough in either direction, anyone, even, you know, even if you're far enough right, then even someone who's on the right, they're just not nearly as far as you, they look far left by comparison, right? It's like, right, look at this right. far left extremist lunatic, and, and the same, the same vice versa, right. right? If you're far enough, if you're far enough left, then someone who's not as far as you, that's why, I mean, there are people now. I mean, gosh, they would accuse. I think they would accuse Obama of being like a a, a neo Nazi or something like that now, because that's <laughs> right, how right. far. Right? Yes, yeah, so, that's yeah. how far it's come. Right, right. Yeah, they'd like like, be all right are moving, too. That's that's the thing about it. The positions are moving, yeah. which is kind of scary in that it's getting worse. As a matter of fact, you mentioned. I think you mentioned the all right because I, I want to say it was uh it was like a Richard Spencer who's um I think he found he kind of coined the term alt right and has been you know one of their their figureheads or whatever. If my if I understand correctly, I think like he's put his his weight behind Joe Biden, you know, yeah. which, which is hilarious because you know obviously last go around he was a Trump guy, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, and now I'm not sure what his rationale is behind it, but it just kind of really shows how difficult it is to kind of get a lay of the land in terms of who the players are and where they are because everybody is shifting, you know everybody's moving right now. Yeah, let let me deal with one comment here because uh, there are some people okay. I will not hesitate to call a moron. Normally, people who tell me what to do on my channel, but here's from MH. MH says, here we go. David Wood channel turning political and starting the division. MH, you might want to go back and you might want to go back and look at the beginnings of my channel. I've always been political. One of the main reasons I deal with Islam is a political concern. I've right. always go, go go back to go back to among our first videos on this channel. What are you going to see? Stuff in Dearborn, free speech issues. We're concerned about that, right? We're concerned about that. I'm concerned about what's going on right now. Normally, normally I don't care a whole lot. I care about, you know, an issue like abortion. Apart from that, I don't care a whole lot on politics. If someone wants big government, okay, make it work. If you want small government, okay, make it work. Just, don't, just, just you guys go out and settle that. You people who are more interested in these issues, go out and, and show me you can, you can figure something out. But I don't care a whole lot. Now, when it's getting to where it affects everyone a lot, right? 
Right. N- now where I can't turn on a football game without being confronted with all of these issues, guess what? It's constantly Ooh. in my face. So guess what? MH, I will talk about it. When I saw a different comment. You said, this channel is only supposed to be for Christianity versus Islam. Who in the world said that? You making rules now, <laughs> right? You, you making rules on my channel? Look, dude, if you don't like it, go somewhere else. That's the best advice I can give you. If you don't like what I'm talking about, go someplace else. It's very simple. My friend Adam and I, we want to talk about we want to talk about this because it's an important issue. And and as far as <laughs> starting the division, it start the division. <laughs> no, you 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 are responsible. <laughs> You and me, Adam. <laughs> you and me, this <laughs> channel. This Everyone channel. was united on everything, and then you and me stepped in. <laughs> Shame on us. <laughs> we ruined America. I mean, it's crazy because, I mean, like, kind of going back to Islam, now, I mean, obviously, you're more well versed at it than I am, but the whole idea of, like, a caliphate, I mean, they, they want to establish, like, total control in any given area. I mean, That's so right. you, you really can't deal with Islam without understanding the, the political implications like you know mm-hmm. it's going to impact how you live mm-hmm. and how wherever you are is governed i mean this is just the nature of worldviews man we're dealing with worlds that's, mm-hmm. that's what it's all about so you know and, and what, what what's cool is and i'm saying this because rusty shackleford here said uh i'd like you to do some philosophy stuff um you're reading my mind rusty shackleford but even when i was even when i'm just a philosophy uh even when i was just in graduate school for philosophy you go to socrates plato the and, and, and even even much later with Locke and so on, lots of philosophers are very interested in um, in politics as well. Right. And you go back to, you know, the the origins of this country. There's there's a saying. Uh, who was that? Was that who was that? Was that Queen Victoria or something? One of the famous. No, dang it! Ah, no, you it's got the, me. I don't know where you're going. The, you it's it's the lady who was the prime minister who died recently uh, back in the day. And Thatcher? I, you talking about Margaret, Margaret Thatcher? I think it was Margaret. Th- ladies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you, you can you can you can answer this for me. My brain is totally fried. Just so everyone knows, I got almost no sleep last night. I realize I can't remember anyone's names, so we're gonna have some trouble during this live stream when we start talking about uh, stuff that's going on. Uh, but um, might be her. But she said, um, "Great Britain was founded on history. The United States was founded on philosophy." Meaning, these are a bunch of guys who took a bunch of philosophical ideas and said, "Hey, let's build a, let's build a country on these." And so, anyway, the point point of all this was, yes, I'm interested in Islam. I'm interested in apologetics, Christian apologetics. Interested in dealing with atheism. Interested in philosophy and interested in politics. And so, point MH is, I'll talk about whatever I want on my channel. You could talk about whatever you want on your channel. Rusty Shackleford, I said you read my mind because actually planning on starting another channel where we focus on political stuff um in other words there's a part of me that that agrees with mh that you know even though i've been covering tons of issues basically whatever i feel like talking about on my channel for 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 years um it is good if you know you kind of divide it up and you say here's my channel where i talk about this and here's my channel where i talk about that so that people who are interested in only that kind of issue can just can just focus there all right adam why don't you uh, before well, before we get started? I, yeah, I realize there, there there may be people who who don't know you. So why don't you uh, tell everyone a little bit about yourself and uh, what you do, what your interests are, and then we'll jump yeah. into the topic. No doubt, man. So yeah, so I'm Adam Coleman. Uh, Early, you said you're the uh, the friendly neighborhood philosopher. You know, I go by the hometown hero. You know, hometown so hero. The same vibe, man. Hometown hero, the real Adam Coleman, and uh, founder of True ID Apologetics Ministries, which. I just want to say I'm excited to say we are now officially a 501c3 organization, man. We are officially a nonprofit, so that just came down the pike about a week or so ago. Uh, so yeah, True Idea Apologetics Ministries. We got a YouTube channel. We were rocking with a podcast. We have uh, you know blogs and things of that nature, and a lot of things coming down the pike. But essentially, what we deal with, uh, well, we began uh, tackling the objections to Christianity and, and questions about Christianity that have gained traction in the African American context. We're expanding a little bit, but that's kind of been, the, you know, the the centerpiece of what we do. You know, really, to be completely honest, like this stuff that we're talking about right here is what I'm all about. There, I, I just be, I'm just be real. The black community is under siege ideologically right now. You know, with a number, whether it be the Hebrew Israelites, whether it be Muslims, Moors, atheists, uh, various different perspectives on on what it means to live a moral life. And you know, I want to address those kinds of things. I'm saying I, we want to, you know, dig in and uh, defend the faith. 
and uphold a biblical worldview, which is the what I would believe the only you know chance for any uh, community to thrive, you know, uh, as it should anyway. So that's where we're at, man. True idea apologetics, bro. All right, and why why is this an important topic? And uh, the, the reason the reason. I've wanted to talk about this ever since, you know, the Colin Kaepernick stuff was, was, uh, you know, going on several years ago. Um, but I find I have lots of mixed feelings about everything. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I'm kind of like, yeah, I get this. Oh, I disagree here. Oh, but I get that. Oh, but I got a real problem here. And then, so I kind of, it's not like I have a firm position. It's not like, I, in other words, it's not like I'm, Oh, this is totally wrong, and this is totally stupid, or or or, or the opposite. It's more like uh, kind of lean in this direction, but eh, not a not a lot. And so, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so um, yeah. Let's just go ahead and let's just go ahead and and back it up. Colin Kaepernick, right? Mm-hmm. Go ahead and share your thought. He was he, first. First, I believe he just stayed on the bench for the. Uh, I think he just sat on the bench the first time, yeah. and then there was massive objections to that, and then he decided right. to to take a knee. What are your thoughts as a super woke Christian? <laughs> right. Well, I mean, as far as Colin Kaepernick um, specifically, I mean, yeah, I mean, he was sitting down during the anthem, and then he actually got some advice from a veteran, you know, a guy who served in the military. He's like, hey, man, you know, you, you might be, you might catch some flack for sitting down during the anthem. Why don't you take a knee instead? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so that's what he did. And then, lo and behold, I think that even that made matters you know even worse. That that's what he became iconic for, you know, supposedly you know protesting you know the flag. Um, now, my thoughts on it probably run a little different than you know, than many people. But first of all, like it's it's not anything new. I, I think that that needs to be understood. You know, what Colin Kaepernick did uh, with LeBron James, all these guys that we're going to get into, like what they're doing is is not new. And now here's what I mean by that. So. There's a, a long tradition um, in the African American community, wherein if you have some sort of platform, it's like this unspoken um, understanding that you are, in some sense, responsible to be the microphone or the bullhorn for the black community and its its concerns. Okay, so you know like when you think about you know just a couple of years ago, Muhammad Ali passed. You know what I mean? Muhammad Ali during his day. I mean, geez, I mean, who, you know, was there anybody more outspoken against racism and for their ideology than Muhammad Ali? Now, granted, he packaged it and, you know, he joked around a lot. I mean, he kind of had those facial expressions and things that kind of made him, you know, really likable. He, he was a charismatic guy, but he also refused to serve in the military, you know, for, for his own uh, his, his um, political reasons and tied to the struggle of African-Americans at that time. Um, but, you know, uh, Muhammad Ali. Uh, Jim Brown. Uh, we could talk about uh, Bill Russell. We could talk about Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. We could talk about uh, Dr. J. I mean, we can name athlete after athlete. We could talk about um, now his name is going to escape me right now, but the guy who held up the black, you know, the the black power fist at the Olympics. You know what I'm saying? I mean, th- there's this long line of athletes who have taken it upon themselves to speak out on social issues. Now, why is that? Well, when you think about it, you know, given how segregation works. Given how racism has played itself out throughout America's history, when you're talking about post-slavery, really the only areas within like the social context where uh, black people had more freedom, I guess you could say, to build a platform for themselves and to have a, a louder voice was sports, entertainment, and from the pulpit, right? Um, you, you couldn't necessarily live on a, whatever town, side of town you wanted. And you couldn't necessarily make the kind of connections you wanted business-wise back in the day due to segregation and so forth. But you can play basketball. You can play football. And you can, you can gain notoriety that way. You can be, you know, you can be number 42, you know what I'm saying, and play, and play baseball and, and, and gain, you know, um, a platform for yourself that way. So in these areas where black people have had a longer period of time where they could gain for themselves a platform, Again, it was understood that you would use that platform for the good of the community. And so that's why these guys today, really, when you see with Colin Kaepernick, it's just a reemergence, if you will, of that. You know what I'm saying? That's that's what you're seeing right now. LeBron James, that's why he feels the need to, you know, speak out, you know, wear the I can't breathe shirt or um, you know, start the school that he started. And we can get into that in a second. But and, and as a matter of fact, just I, I know I'm being long winded, but I really want people to understand this, you know, because I feel like they they think these things are like an aberration, but you know, um, when it comes to like Michael Jordan, for example, 
Now, I don't know if you're aware of it, but it's, it's somewhat came up in that recent documentary, The Last Dance. Like one of the biggest knocks on him is that during his, you know, rise to you know fame and all that kind of stuff is that he was perceived as somebody who didn't use his platform to ostensibly like you know just like really be loud about the issues of black america that's been that was kind of like a smudge on, on his resume if you will up until recently a couple of weeks uh, months ago rather he had an article uh where he spoke out about these kind of things but that, so that's kind of like the historical you know backdrop we can get into some other elements but you know that's where this stuff is coming from like this stuff isn't new mm-hmm. you know and i think people really need to hear that yeah. yeah, and uh, I'll go ahead and share uh, share my thoughts going back to, to Kaepernick on why, why I kind of had uh, mixed feelings about a lot of things, because a lot of people flip out even for me saying that I uh, am not completely on, you know, I'm not completely firm in a position. So uh, on, sure. the one, on the one hand, on the one hand, I'm thinking in terms of like, uh, let's say G.K. Chesterton in his book Orthodoxy, he has a chapter, The, the Flag of the World. And he, he's, he's arguing that, that you have to have, um, you know, a kind of just firm loyalty. I mean, he, go, he goes on to, to apply it to like the, the world as a whole and so on. But at first he's talking about uh, a patriot, a patriot as someone who loves his country while still seeing its flaws. Right. Mm. He said, if you're just too optimistic, then no one can criticize anything. Everything is wonderful. And if you're too pessimistic, well, then you just hate everything around you. And you just want to you just want to see the end of it. And so he thinks the balance is a true patriot, not a false patriot. A false patriot would be someone who uh, who is, is is blind to to the, the faults in his country. And he says a true patriot wants his country to be as good as possible. But he also love he also loves his country. And you're not going to you're not going to shake his love for his country. And he, he even compares this to like a wife. Um, he said he said he said, you know, a, a, a good wife will defend her husband to the death if, if someone's, mm-hmm. you know, some if someone's attacking her family. But behind closed doors, look, honey, you gotta work on this, right? You gotta you gotta she'll 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 she might call him out, right? And right. so Chesterton applies that to to a country. And so basically whenever someone is whenever someone is is saying something to me or arguing something to me, that there's kind of two things I'm focused on. One, what are you saying and, and do I agree with it or disagree with it? But two, what what are your intentions? Because mm-hmm. you could say something that I agree with and I, you know, but I don't trust your intentions. Uh, or you sure, can say something, right. you can say something that I completely disagree with and I think you're totally wrong, but I know you mean well. And so I'm not going to, I'm not going to get upset about it. So when I see right. someone like, when I see someone like Colin Kaepernick uh, taking a knee, uh, it's it's in my mind. Does he hate America? Is he is he someone who I hate America and I want it to, to burn it to the ground? Or right, right, right. is it no? I love this place and it needs to be better. It needs to it needs to be better because that 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 yeah. changes my that affects my perspective on, sure. on what he's doing. So one there's one there's there are those kind of issues and then there's always the issue of wait a minute you know if we want to go in a the route of strong suspicion he wasn't doing very well as a quarterback. Um, that's true. Yeah, it just yeah, wasn't yeah. doing well. So it's, it's always, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say, cause I can't, I can't, I can't judge his heart, but is he, is he jumping here because, you know, he's, he's depressed because he's benched and so on. And he's deciding mm-hmm. to go in this new direction or, is, you know, so, so there are those kinds of issues and, you know, it, it, you kind of think, Hey, all our other disagreements, can there be something that we all stand united on? Like, you know, mm-hmm. our, you know, standing, for the national anthem or something like that. Oh, is there something like that? Because if there's nothing, then I don't know, we, we might be screwed. So there's, there, there are those issues. Then there's the issue of, I just, at the end of the day, I don't think it will be effective. I look at things like sports mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. say, these are things that actually do unite people. And so it's like, when, when people are getting along well, my, my inclination is, hey, I don't wanna mess with that stuff, right? Let people get along mm-hmm. well. They're all cheering for the same team. It's not based on race. It's based on what which team you're 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 supporting. And you've got white kids and black kids cheering for white players and black players. Yeah, and, like the uh, Garbage Steelers. You know, you know. Man. <laughs> hey. Oh. Oh. So, yeah. That's what you said. People getting along, and then somebody's yeah, yeah. throwing something in there. To... <laughs> that's what I mean. So you you have those kind of issues. And so when someone says, "Hey, I'm going to inject." politics into this. I'm going to make this a big political scene. And now all the attention is going to be on me and everyone's forced to take sides and the league has to make a decision. It's like, wait a minute. To me, that's like, you know, 
if if my kids and your kid, you know, my kids and your kids are playing together on a playground, that's that's not the time for us to jump in there and say, ha ha, he's oppressing you. And let's tell you about the history of oppression. No, that's you guys learn to get along very well, right? You guys yeah, learn yeah, to get yeah. along well. We'll talk about that other stuff, you know, at a different time. So, uh, yeah, I, I think it's kind of disastrous to inject polit politics and not just on that, right? Like I mentioned, I'm against abortion. If someone started, hey, everyone has to take a so take sides on abortion during this, you know, NFL games. Like, wait, wait, what? No, I mean, come on. Let, 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 Here's a, here's an area where we, we can all get along. So anyway, mm -hmm. those are kind of issues where I'm like, eh, I, I don't think this I don't think this is a good idea, and uh, not crazy about it. But, um, but a couple issues on the other side. One, I think we've been, I think we've kind of get, gotten too soft with, and I know I'm talking a ton, so you can talk. No, you that's can, cool. You yeah, can talk I mean, a ton I, too. I yeah, yeah. I just yeah, wanted yeah, to kind yeah. of get all the thoughts on the table so that yeah, you yeah. Know, like later I can you. people know where I stand. Um, right. On, on the other I think we've gotten way too soft and sensitive about things like protests. I mean, when you go back to the origins of this country, I mean, but even before that, before, it, you know, back when we were colonies, mm -hmm. these guys, look, you can, you, you raised our, you raised our tea tax. Oh, someone, <laughs> Somebody's about to you, better, you better correct it. Someone's got to die. Right. I mean, <laughs> so they were, they were all in favor of, of, uh, protests and not always not always peaceful not always peaceful protests and so on. so it's kind of it's kind of built into the fabric there and it's one of i think it's one of the glories of western civilization is that when something is going you know when something is going wrong the default method is to uh you know talk about it discuss it expose it protest it but not for a lot of human history it was just you know, we disagree with you and so it's it's bloodbath it's right? head, yeah, and so i yeah. look at and it's oh, that way in a lot of places right now. I mean, you know, it, it certainly is. Yeah, and so and so, you know, on something like this, I like. Wait a minute, you're all flipping out because the guy took a knee. <laughs> I mean, right, 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 right. I mean, that, well, that, I mean, that's, that's too much for you. you. That mm -hmm. that's no, that's that's my issue right there. You know what I'm saying? And I know people are going to disagree, but I guess just kind of hear me out. So back in like 2004, and I'll make, I'll make this real quick. I was actually held at gunpoint, you know, over in uh, in Kenya. Right? We had some guys. We were out of this church, you know, situation, and some dudes rolled up. And the military vehicle was like, look, unless y'all give us some money, it's going to be a problem, you know. And I'll never forget, like, one of the thoughts I was thinking, you know, at that time, I just feel like it's like in the movies. Like, everything slows down. It's like it's a like, super weird feeling. And I'll never forget thinking, like, dang, I'm not in America right now. Like, this could really be a wrap. Like, this this might really be it, you know. Now, obviously, I, I made it through because I'm here talking to you. But I said that to say that I think that when you have, like, these nonviolent types of protests, like, even if you find it to be objectionable, man— I think we really have to be careful about, you know, stifling people on that because mm -hmm. we don't want it to be a place yep. where people feel like, you know what, the only way for me to get your attention or to get my point across or to see my agenda through is violence. I'm saying like that one of the things that has made America I think make the gains the kind of gains that it has is that there has been a place for nonviolent protests. You know what I'm saying and even some protests that that go the wrong direction or whatever, but we're not we don't live in a state like China for example where cats are getting run over by you know, tanks and stuff like that. You know, it's never been, well, <laughs> at least not that way now anyway. Yeah. But, you know, my whole point is, you know, I think we need to allow for certain levels of, I guess, kind of objectionable protests that kind of relieve, the, relieve that pressure valve. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because we don't want to, because there's places right now, bro, like if, if you have a problem, they, they're not trying to vote you out. It's, you know, they're cutting off arms. They're coming mm -hmm. out with machetes, bro. Like it's, that's it, you know? If we don't want America to become that kind of a place, then I think we have to allow for some of these protests that maybe we don't like it, but, you know, I mean, look at where we are now. We got cities burning, bro. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, may, had had we gone a different direction, you know, with Colin Kaepernick, then maybe we wouldn't be where we are now. I don't know. But I think we have to give space for that. Yeah. And no, I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you completely. And, and that's part of the reason that, like, Lots of people think I'm a jerk for making fun of Islam or making fun of Muhammad and so on. And oh, what a hateful person. Part of that is, part of that is, I understand there's a lot of people getting very, very troubled by Islam. And so what are you going to do about it? Well, if you don't like it, attack the ideology, criticize the ideology. Uh, right. if, you, if you're, if you're, you know, you're really annoyed, make fun of it, mock it, mock, mock Muhammad and so on. Just don't go out on a killing spree. What's interesting is uh, Anders Breivik, the guy who did that uh, uh, did that massacre in Norway uh, several years ago. Oh yeah, yeah, right. 
Breivik said in his manifesto, he said, you know, I was interested in politics in, in the 90s. And I realized anytime I said anything that went against the grain, I was shouted down as racist. What's interesting mm. is that guy's indisputably a racist. I don't know if he started off as a racist or that he was actually became one. But um, he said, so I realized that no, anything I say that doesn't agree with, you know, the mainstream, they call me a racist. And therefore, the time for talk is over. Right. Mm -hmm. The time for talk is over. And the only thing that will that will make me heard violent shock attacks. Right. So so th that again, people we tend to forget in, in the U.S. how how good we've had it when, when it comes to that. A lot of human history. Sure. You, you have disagreements. Someone someone has to die. So so that's kind of one. There's there's that kind of thing going on um, that I think is actually good for for people to uh, protest and, and, mm -hmm. and take you know take things in a peaceful realm. There's also the issue. It's always it's always in my. <laughs> I don't think I don't th I don't know if anyone talks. You can tell me if anyone talks about this. Um, okay. Doesn't doesn't have to be John Adams in in particular. But I've always thought. Okay. But let, let, let me let me just quote him here. I pull, I pulled it up while we were talking. So John Adams, one of the founding fathers, second president of the United States, one of the founding fathers who was vehemently against slavery. Oh, man, yeah. man did not like slavery. Sure. Sure. And so he, he would talk about all the all, all, all the reasons that slavery is bad. But uh, this this uh, quotation is interesting. Mm. Uh, he says, I shudder when I think of the calamities which slavery is like likely to produce in this country. Mm. You would think me mad if I were to describe my anticipations. If the gangrene is not stopped, I can see nothing but insurrection of the blacks against the whites. Mm. Now. If you just read that and you don't read anything else he says, it sounds like, oh, we better stop it because otherwise these black people are going to rise up against us and we don't want that. That's actually right, right. not what he's saying. He's saying hmm. we have founded our country upon the idea that we have rights from the almighty and that if someone, someone is trampling on your rights, you actually have a right from the almighty to violently revolt against it. And simultaneously with that as our bedrock of our country the bedrock of our country being this idea that you have rights from god and that if someone uh tramples on those rights you get to violently revolt against them we've got millions of people <laughs> we've got millions of people who are being brutally oppressed guys do the math on this one it's a matter of time before these people over here say wait a minute wait a minute we get to go on a killing spree, according to the according to the 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 the, the foundational principle of this country. That in order to in order to ensure our future rights, this this government this government has trampled all over our rights. Uh, this government has established a tyranny over us. These are oppressors, and we get to violently revolt. That's what he's saying. He's saying guys. Right. Do, he's saying guys do the math here. So anyway, the point of all of that was, it's always in my mind that didn't happen right mm. it's, it's it's you had the civil war you had you had you had some other things but this mass violent uprising that adams warned was the necessary result of saying you have a god-given right to to violently rise up if you're being massively oppressed and oh here's this group that's been massively oppressed you put those together boom there's a blood there's a huge bloodbath coming right Yes, I mean, you know, a, a nationwide Nat Turner esque revolt. You know what I'm yeah. saying? I mean, that that's what you're looking at. As yeah. a matter of fact, interestingly enough, so uh, Toussaint Louverture, you know, was a uh, you know general down there in um, Haiti, San Domingo mm -hmm. at the time. And as I understand it, you know, that was actually kind of the impetus behind his revolt. You know, he he actually read a guy. There's another guy that kind of preceded him a little bit named Abby Raynal. and Raynal kind of writes this uh, book. And it, there's one part portion of it where it talks about like basically. In a weird way, it's almost kind of like the Ubermensch, you know, that what's his name talked about? They're kind of a like Superman figure who's going to yeah. come along as a like leader and free people who are oppressed. Mm -hmm. And so my understanding is that Tucson, Tucson Louverture reads that and it makes an impression on him. Lo and behold, he ends up going on to, again, revolting against France. I mean, they overthrow, you know, well, kick them out of the country, start their own republic and so on and so forth. But it's kind of like the same idea, you know, and really when you think about it, you know, Nat Turner, uh, you know, Gabriel Prosser. I mean, these are these are other individuals here, here in America anyway. Where you see these revolts, and both of those individuals appeal to theism, you know, mm -hmm. as, as as the bedrock as to why they were doing what they were doing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whether we agree with it or not, I mean, it is this. It's an idea that's not foreign 
to America's ideology. Like, hey, you know, we have these rights. And if you're not going to respect them, mm-hmm. there's going to be a problem. I mean, that's, that's how it's always been. So I'm not advocating. I'm not saying that, you know, Colin Kaepernick should have, you know, rather than taking knees, just start, you know, shooting people. Or no, something. no, I'm, me, I'm no, me neither. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just clarify, you know, I don't want the feds knocking on my door or something. You know, but uh, but but I think that we have to understand that there's got to be a consistency. You know, per- perfect example. You know, if you look at, I would encourage people to look up the Barber Rewards. Barber Rewards. You know what I'm saying? Just Google it. And in America, and for whatever reason, nobody talks about it, but in America's earliest days, between like 1801 and 1815, it fought two wars. You know, the Barbary Wars, where you have uh, these North African pirates off of the Barbary coast. You know, they were going out, they were raiding uh, English, French, Danish, and American ships, stealing white people and selling them into slavery in North, in North Africa. And so after America and other countries got tired of paying for ransom for these folks, they went over and fought them. Mm-hmm. You know, now, mind you, again, this is in the early 1800s. So at the same time where America is going over to North Africa to free white enslaved persons, they're holding African enslaved persons right here in America, right? So uh, just imagine the, just the kind of duplicity there, right? Yeah. It, it's hard to maintain some semblance of uh, moral high ground when that's the case. And mm-hmm. so we have to be careful about these things. I don't want to see America devolve into some sort of civil war. I don't, I don't want to see that. But I think that you know, we need to do a better job of you know, opening up discussion you know, and really having genuine you know, dialogue with one another because what happens, it's just like in therapy. I'm a social worker by trade. If, if you're not, if you don't feel heard, you start to scream. That's when you begin to raise your voice, and th- and th- I feel like that's what's happening right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So uh, as far as as far as uh, why I brought that up with uh, with John Adams, I w- I would have said the same thing if I, if I were if I were during that time, and I were uh, and I were doing the math, I would say, wait, we just built our we just built our country on the idea that. Uh, once a government is oppressing you, you have a right to revolt against it. Um, and we're oppressing tons of people. This this leads to an inevitable bloodbath. The point the point is, it it didn't happen. Again, you had civil war. You had you had a lot of bad things, but you didn't have that. Hey, we're 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 rising up and and going on a killing spree. So no, my point is, whenever anything's going on, whether it's a a protest, really, even if it's even if it's a riot, but let alone if it's Kaepernick taking a knee, it's always kind of could have been worse. <laughs> this could this could have been complete way 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 worse. Could've and been. and according to the founding fathers, even would have been justified, right? With their with it would have been it would have been justified because you know, you know, yeah. so 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 there's that and there's there's kind of one more issue that that's always that's always in my mind. It's uh, I believe it was letter for letter from Birmingham jail, mm. where is, is you could correct me if I'm wrong here. I I have I haven't read that in. I read it multiple times while I was in jail. <laughs> oh, did you really? Interesting. Yeah, Interesting. conveniently. Yeah, right, right. Um, but uh, no, I thought it was. I thought it was. I thought it was one of the the, the best essays. I probably the best essay I had ever read. Um, right, right. But oh, yeah. I think it was in there because I read a few of the. I read a few letters, but uh, I think it was in that one where there were people who agreed with him. Right. There were there were. He was responding to Christian leaders who agreed with him as far as they agreed on the problem. They mm-hmm. agreed on the goal. They agreed on what everyone is aiming at. But they're telling Martin Luther King you're going about this wrong you're mm-hmm. you're stirring things up annoying too many people and we want you to calm down just let things sort of come about organically right. and then everything you know everything will be okay but g- guess what i mean just martin luther king look look things are getting better things are better than they were 100 years ago things are better than they were 200 years ago it's all getting better yeah. so don't rock the boat things are improving now i'm sure that made perfect sense to those people at that time oh I'm sure they, they believe yeah, they, yeah right yeah. Them up, and, sure. and, and 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 i'm always thinking if i were a if i were a christian pastor i might have i might have said the same thing i might have said mm. hey we're getting better don't rock the boat on this man don't don't be out there and chill out yeah, right, yeah, right. yeah don't be up stirring up things with the cops and so on don't don't do it and so it's that's always in my mind that just because i'm looking at someone going i don't think this is a good idea i don't think this is actually going to be very helpful i think if you did this instead this would actually be more helpful it's always in my mind that lots of people have thought like that and been wrong and so i just kind of yeah. don't i kind of don't take i kind of don't take it as my place to say Nope, you're wrong. It's if you ask me, I'll say, yeah, I think I'm wrong. But I, at the end of the day, I don't know. And lots of people, you know, lots of people 50, 60 years ago who thought they were, you know, they they were right about, you know, their plans and so on actually didn't 
turned out to be they a wrong. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's so funny. I mean, that he he's responding to these people from jail. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, he's like, you're telling you're telling me to wait and hold off. But like, I'm, I'm in jail right now as I responded to you, you know, fighting for liberty and so forth. And I think that's the the, the reality is and people are, you know, people are going to get mad at me. You know what I mean? But, you know, th- this is just check the history for yourself. Don't take my word for it. OK, um, if you understand why MLK would do things like marches rather than resorting to violence, like part of his uh, methodology was to use marches and the media to mobilize white people who were on the fence, particularly, you know, white Christians, you know, who were on the fence about the issues of their time. That's what, that's the whole goal. It's like, look, you can kind of stiff arm it and keep us at bay, but if you're watching the nightly news and you're seeing people being bitten and water hoses and all that kind of stuff, it's going to provoke that conscience, right? Because you have people on the fence. Now, the problem is, Really, Martin Luther, I'm going to kind of sound redundant because Martin Luther King wasn't doing anything new at that time. That it, it has always been a strategy towards racial progress to mobilize white people who are on the fence about racial issues of their time. That's why Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. You know what I'm saying? Because she was trying to mobilize the Christian, you know, I guess, I don't know, the conservatives, I don't know what term they would have considered themselves, but Christians at the time, she was trying to mobilize white Christians, provoke their conscience to get involved. That's always been the case. Mm -hmm. And so, whereas I think that today, um, this may take us into a different direction, but whereas I think that today people assume that, you know, all of the the angst and and protests are, are coming from, you know, these leftist liberals and so on and so forth. Like, look, guys, you know, like, let's, let's, Let's uh, let's concede that Colin Kaepernick, Colin Kaepernick in total, is not the model that I as a Christian want to follow. You know I'm saying if, if you just follow everything he says and all this kind of stuff, I get that. But wait a minute, is there a moral reality that Christians can take hold of from a biblical perspective and say, you know what, he might be wrong-headed in terms of how he's addressing this issue, but is there an injustice here? Is there something that is divergent from the biblical worldview that we as Christians can show people the right way to engage it? And I think that's where we are. That's that's where we need to be, rather. Yeah. yeah, and uh, going going along those lines, what what you just said, you know, even if you you don't think Colin Kaepernick uh, is the model, because uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not crazy about uh, I'm not crazy about Kaepernick, but e- even even if you have you know someone like Kaepernick, um, I think people should understand that. Wait a minute, when you see when you see polls on people who agree with them or disagree with them in a white community and polls about who agrees with them or disagrees with them in the black community back mm-hmm. then, it should, it should draw your attention to the idea that, yeah, that there's, there's, there's something going on. There's, sure. there's something going on that maybe, maybe in your community, you aren't fully aware of the experience of, of that other community. And maybe you, maybe even if you say, Hey, I don't like Colin Kaepernick. And I think what he did was stupid. Mm-hmm. He just re- he just showed me something that that I need to be aware of, and if you're not, if you right. just say, "Up, oh, no, we're going to push all that aside," well, guess what? Four years later, things turn out to be a lot worse, right? Because uh, right, so they're they're at the very least, at the very least, you would have to say, "Hey, there is a lot of resentment in uh, certain communities against police." Uh, against all, it could be all, all kinds of things, but uh, if you notice, a lot of the time it's like, s- s- stop whining. <laughs> you don't have any problems. Right, it's right, not right. as ba- it's not as bad as you're saying, um, right. and so on. And, and, and you, you know, you can say that, but guys, that resentment is still there. That resentment is still there. And if if you don't come up with some way of, of resolving that and dealing with that and bringing that to the surface then someone's going to come in there and take advantage of it. Someone's going to come in there and take advantage of, of that just by right. walking, just by walking in and being that that Superman. You, you don't even have to be a Superman. You're just walking in there saying, "I'm the Put one that gap, I'm the one that'll fix this for you." And then people right. rally around that. And if right. that's a if that's a radical Marxist organization that wants to burn everything to the ground, then well, if they, yeah, they're going to step in and fill that void, right? I mean, and yeah. it's unfortunate. rest of the rest. Yes, yeah, like rest of the world, you had your chance. <laughs> <laughs> you decided to ignore it. Now this other group, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's real. And, and, and no, I think there's a deeper problem too, and in, in that, and I'm, I'm trying to just you know, steel man or play devil's advocate. Like when I watch sports, 
you know, I think most men are like this. I mean, not, and not just men, just people in general. It, it is a, a, a form of escape. It's entertainment, right? I want to escape from everyday life. You know, I've worked nine to five, Monday through Friday. It's Sunday night, and the mood is right. I want to have some fun, you know. It's, you know what I mean? And, and I want to watch, the, you know, Monday. Night, actually, I totally watched that that theme song. I've had, I think that was TJIF I was quoting. But anyway, you guys get the idea, you know. But I want to detach from my everyday life and watch some sports. So when somebody intrudes upon my escape with something that forces me back into the real world, that's uncomfortable, right? That's 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 not why I watch sports. I watch sports to get away, and you're not allowing me to get away. That's a very human emotion. I think there's a clash there, but I think part of the problem is we have to understand, whereas that's a real emotion, and I get it, I, I think that sometimes we look at um, athletes as characters as opposed to persons. I'm saying it's almost like, you know, when you're watching, you know, Law and Order or some drama or some comedy, like we're used to watching characters. But when it comes to sports, like they're not characters. You know what I'm saying I think it's, we tend to look at them as characters because, you know, they're throwing a ball and they, they feel a, a, they're playing a particular role for this team that I like. You know what I'm saying they're involved in this drama of sports or whatever. But these are people. They're, they're not playing a role. I mean, they're not they're not acting, if you will. And these people have family members who are in communities that are impacted by something they believe to be really serious. And if it was you, if you had this opportunity to make it known to the world that people that you love and care about are experiencing something that's really messed up, would you take that opportunity, even if it meant infringing upon somebody's comfort? Um, I, I think that you probably would. I, th I think most people probably would. And so I think that reasonable people can disagree about the protests and what should, they should do, what they shouldn't do, whatever. And that's fine. That's, that's where dialogue should happen. But I think that we've got to do a better job on, on both sides of the conversation to see each other as people and understanding that we've got person, you know, personal motivations, you know, real human motivations for, for what it is that, that we do. Um, no. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree com completely on that, that think of uh, think of each other as persons. And you and I are both Christians, so we would ultimately want people to think of each other as created in the image of God, and therefore having right. uh, having right. a you know massive uh, built-in dignity uh, right. and and right. worth and worth. Um, b because yeah, I mean you know again p part of what I do with Islam, and people don't get this right. It, it's uh, I mean lots of lots of Muslims don't get this. Um, I mean I pointed out, I'm trying to avoid a bloodbath here. Right. I'm looking, you know, on, yeah. with Islam. Right. I said, OK, here's this ideology. It's growing. And the more it grows, the more pressure it puts on other people. And people in the West find out they're not allowed to criticize it because they'll be called racist. And so there's all this underlying tension that's building up. And I'm looking at that going, you give that a couple more decades. That looks like that looks like global bloodbath. Um, yeah. Is there is there something we can do to avoid that? And I think, yeah, uh, you know. Muslims, if you can learn that, hey, it's okay to criticize, you don't kill people over cartoons and things like that. And people in the West, if you realize, hey, there are people criticizing Islam, it doesn't mean they're racist or that they want Muslims to die. They disagree with the ideology. And it's good that they're responding to it peacefully by arguing against it. That's good. Even mocking right. it, great. It's peaceful. And, it, you know, so if, 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 if there's something we can do to avoid the bloodbath down the road, then uh then i think i think it's it's good to do that and so now in in this situation where we look and each i mean every two or three years we're hitting record levels of polarization mm. you're looking right. at that and say how do we how what can we do about that what can we do about that well you 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 pointed out one thing instead of you know as it is now oh you said this thing that i disagree with and therefore you're my mortal enemy and I hope you die. You know, it's, <laughs> right, it's, it's, right, right, it's right. that kind of thing. And, and it, 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 it just doesn't seem to be, hey, I have not had the experiences that you have. I haven't had the upbringing that you have. I don't have the same family members that you've, 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 you have. I don't have the same friends you have. Um, I, don't li I don't watch the same shows and news programs that you have. And therefore, um, maybe there are some reasons that we disagree on these things and maybe yeah, maybe yeah. if we stop flipping out on each other and just you know and actually hey why don't you sit down and tell me and uh maybe that would actually work out better than you know flipping out on flipping out on everybody and so well i mean i'm be honest with you i, I think and i'm not trying to be like doom and gloom but I, I feel like the best opportunity that this country has to survive whatever it is that we're facing right now 
is the gospel. And and not only in terms of just the preaching of the gospel, but the living out of the scope of the gospel. Because if you and I, this this, this conversation is a perfect example. You know, what I'm saying we come from different, you know, you know uh, backgrounds or what have you. You know, what I'm saying, and we're sitting down talking about these things. Why? Because we have the bond of peace, the bond of love. You know, one lo- one Lord, one faith, one baptism. You know, we are unified at the cross. And that puts us in this vantage point to where now we can deal with difficult issues, you know what I'm saying, where we've got this underlying unity. And you know what I'm saying? So so we have this this context that we can hash out maybe stuff that's pretty difficult. That's the advantage that the church has over the world, right? But that's so it's not just that we're we're saved, you know what I'm saying, but we're actually exemplifying what it is that the gospel means as we live it out. That's the best chance, I think, that for this country. For Christians, it's like it's like what Jesus said, that they will know you're my disciples. By how you love one another, you know what I'm saying that's we're supposed to be a city on the hill in, the, in this instance. That's where we need to be, and we can exemplify for the world what it looks like to overcome generational racism. That's that's where that should be the vantage point of the church. So I think that I was I'll just say this. I mean, if we're for anybody who isn't humbling themselves to to the Holy Spirit and allowing Him to work on them, I don't care what color you are. I'm saying if anybody who's not humbling themselves in that regard such that he can use them in this time to that end, then we're really missing an opportunity uh, to point people to Christ, man. We're, we're missing that. We, we, we can't be asleep at the wheel right now. Mm-hmm. It, I w- this is weird because I wasn't even thinking of, of the connection here until mm-hmm. you were talking about that. But uh, earlier today... Uh, Before I went live, I was revisiting book one of Plato's Republic, and that's where Socrates Mm. has this, uh, uh, they're trying to define justice, and he has a discussion with Cephalus, Cephalus doesn't care, then Cephalus' son Polymarchus uh, gets into the discussion, and then Socrates faces this this sophist named Thrasymachus, one of my favorite characters in all, the guy's a total screaming jerk <laughs> but uh he, he, <laughs> he's one of your favorite characters yeah he cracks me he cracks me uh, it's, it's it's because yeah, yeah. of that but um uh, so anyway so uh, on the issue of the the sophists the sophists were kind of the the nemeses of the philosophers the philosophers were trying to get to the truth of everything the the sophists were complete relativists they didn't believe there was any real truth to anything so they believed that everything was just under the power of rhetoric so they were people who mm. trained trained you and how to you pay them large sums of money so that they would teach your children how to win any sort of argument right mm. and as you were you know as you were talking it, it occurred to me that you know as as this country uh abandons its foundations right as the country abandons its 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 the foundations of thought well, that's what's left. What's left is rhetoric, right? What's left, in other words, if if, mm. if if people do not agree on what we are, what rights we have, or, or there's no concept of why we would even have rights, why I should view you as a person, why I should care whether you you live or die, uh, if there's no real, if there's no real truth to get to, if there's no, if there, if you and I don't agree that hey there's a truth and we're the kinds of we're the kinds of beings we're created in the image of god and we can get to the truth so even though we have these massive disagreements i bet if we sit down here and and reason through this we can actually get to it if you don't actually believe that there's any real truth to get to um and you don't you you don't agree why why do people have rights everything comes down to rhetoric how can i rally people around my cause and paint everyone who disagrees with me as the enemy and Mm, so mm -hmm. you're you're totally correct it's if 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 we abandon our foundations then that's what's left and guys that that's all that leads to is a bunch of charismatic leaders who can manipulate millions of people and the different leaders who have millions of followers smashing them against each other and That's what and and, and That's seeing what who wins and so yeah this uh <laughs> but anyway point of that was you're 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 right you need the, the the gospel is the is the solution to this well i'm always right so that's not nothing new man but you know it's <laughs> I'm right about everything. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's funny you should say that. So just the other day, shout out to my man Matt Jackson. He sent me this video where Arian Foster, who's a former NFL running back, uh, you know, black guy, overt, you know, super atheist. You know what I'm saying? He's, he's outspoken. I'm not going to disparage. Outspoken atheist. 
And um, he's having this conversation with, I don't know why I can't remember this guy's first name, but his uh, last name is was Silverman. I guess he used to be the president of the Atheist something or other. He's debated yeah, versus, I think, like, I think James, Church and guys. Yeah, I, I think James White debated him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think he debated I, I want to say, like, maybe Frank Turk debated him as well. And so, anyway, you know, these are two atheists. And, you know, Aaron Foster has uh, Silverman come on the show, you know, talking about systemic racism and, and basically the things that we're talking about right now. And it was just funny to me hearing Aaron Foster appeal to things that you know, really atheism, I would argue, has no basis for. I mean, I guess he, he considers himself a humanist, but, you know, when it comes to, you know, valuing the, the, the dignity of even like, you know, um, felons and stuff like that and people who have committed crimes. And, and it was funny because uh, Silverman didn't share all those intuitions. You know, but it's like, how how do you argue as as an atheist? Particularly, I'm thinking just like black atheism. You know, what I'm saying? you know, that's what I deal with all the time on my show. But you know, black atheists, I I, I find that they often want to import Christian ideals into their atheism that is just and is just not there. And so they're arguing for like justice and you know human value and Black Lives Matter and all this kind of stuff. I mean, fam, how? I'm saying if you're just an assembly of molecules in motion. You know that you know came in existence through the Big Bang, and then boom, we're just you know we're here you know billions of years later. Uh, where where does value come in the picture? You know what I'm saying where where do you where are these moral arts that you're appealing to? What, what do you mean Black Lives Matter? Matter to who and how? You know it's just amazing to me. You know, but but to your point, if you're removing some of these these foundational these columns of what a moral system needs, i.e. God, then you're left with uh, just who can make a better argument? Who can be or not even that? Who can be more compelling? Mm-hmm. It's not even it's not even necessarily making a good argument. It's who can be more compelling? Yep. And you can be compelling for good reasons and bad. You yep. know. And 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 part part of the strategy. I want to start. I want to start making videos titled things like "How You're Being Manipulated: A Psychopath Explains," because we can we can kind of see it. But I mean, p- part of, part of the general strategy, if you're a manipulator, is and and you, you want to be you know, sort of the, the leader and you want to take seize power and, and so on. Part of the strategy is looking for areas where there's this underlying resentment and presenting yourself as the, as the solution. Right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. and, and this is going to, you know, that this will be increasing as things become more and more polarized, this will happen more and more. Right. So, so right now it's, sure. you know, you've got black lives matter and then the democratic party uh, seizing on that. Right. And saying, look, everyone is racist. What are we going to do about it? Do you want everyone to be racist? No. So uh, all these people are racist. We're the ones that'll, that'll deal with that and protect you from those people. Now think about this. If your entire movement is empowered, if your source of power is racism, do you really want to deal with the problem? <laughs> Right. No, I mean, what, right, what would right, you right. do? So, so if your if, if your entire platform is everyone is racist, suppose you know, suppose you flipped a switch right now, now or everyone right, took a right. everyone took a pill and it made them not racist. Okay, now what do we need you for anymore? What, 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 why does anyone need you? That was that was that was that was all you were doing for society. So, so it, it, you have you have one side over here, and it's those people are all racist. We're the solution, right? But mm-hmm. as people become more and more polarized, and there's rioting in the streets, then on the other side, it's going to be those people are all crazy. You know you're not. You know you're not racist. They're insane. <laughs> They're burning cities down. They're insane. So we're the ones who are going to save you from that. So they're going to look. We know you're all afraid because you see your cities being burned to the ground. We're the ones who will deal with that problem. And the other side is no. We'll the we're the ones who will deal with that with those racists. And so you, you, you're going to have these you're going to have these leaders here that right. yes. Um, they're the problem and I'm the solution. So, so rally around me. Problem yeah. is both sides can, can get a pretty massive following doing that. And if you have two sides that are becoming oh, yeah. increasingly polarized and more hateful and resentful towards the opposing sides, that's a, that's a, that's a recipe for, for a, for a bloodbath. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. question from Black Tuesday Films here. Black Tuesday, okay. Um, directed towards me. You can jump in as well. It says, I just want to make sure I understand your point. You're saying we should allow people to protest peacefully, but you're against violent protests. Uh, no, actually, not my position. Um, there, there's a place for for violent protest, right? So, uh, but the the point here is, if people are protesting peacefully, it should be in your mind. Well, it, it, you know, things could be much worse. Things could be much worse, right? Sure. And when yeah. you think so, the the point here. I mean, if you look at the founding fathers, they believed in they believed in violent protest you say no but <laughs> right. no but in the in the constitute in the constitution right there it says the right to peaceably is something yeah that's in those situations right 
these are the same these are the same people who said we'll go to war with you because right. you're you we'll go to war with you king george we'll go to war <laughs> i mean you're look, you're, look, look, you're taxing us and we don't even have anyone in congress you gotta die dude right. we gotta die gotta this go, is bro. war right? go yeah and it's funny i was watching uh hamilton um you know a couple, couple months ago i mean and, and I, I read the dude's story but it just clicks like yo hamilton they aaron burr sh straight shot that man <laughs> I'm like, like these dudes I mean, these weren't really peaceful guys out here. You know what I'm saying? Not across the board, anyway. You know, these aren't the kind yeah. of guys who just kind of let stuff slide. Now, yeah. I'm not advocating that people need to be out here doing duels and stuff. Let, let me make that clear. Let's bring it but, back. Yeah, I mean, I, I, said bring but it back. But we'll, you know, we'll like, do it rap duels. All right, hey, that'll work. Well, I mean, actually, funny enough, that's kind of how breaking, like, mm -hmm. you know, in some instances, was utilized, right? Break dancing. Yeah. You know, instead of killing each other, you know, you have a break dance battle or something like that. Maybe, maybe we need to do that. Maybe, maybe we should propose instead of Trump and Biden. You know, uh, doing a debate. Maybe they need to have a break that dance battle and just kind of squash it out that way, man. Maybe that'd be better. But, but, um, but I, I mean, I think that you know we have to put things in context in in the sense that yeah, I, I don't think that put it this way. I think it's uncommon where there will be justification for a violent revolt. You know what I'm saying, I mean, and by uncommon, I mean like you really have to. And, and from my view, I think you have to exhaust all plausible options. You know what yep. I'm saying before getting to that point. And by plausible, I mean even going above and beyond to do so. Uh -huh. However, you know that I, I'm not a, a pacifist in the sense that where there's no occasion, you know, for for violence. I think in this broken world where we live, in, you know, I mean, we're living just like kind of Ecclesiastes under the sun. You know, I, I think that um, there are instances where violence is called for. Now, here in America today, I'm of the opinion I don't think that's where we are right now. I I, I don't. And the reason why I say that is is I think that there are processes and means that people can go about affecting change politically, development of civic institutions, economically. I think there's a lot of things that people can do um, to where uh, just outright violence is not warranted, you know? Um, and hopefully we never, I, hope, I mean, golly, I, I mean, I live in America. I hope it never gets to that point. But I mean, I'm not like a flat out pacifist where I'm saying there's there's absolutely no instance. You know, I know, I know some people would disagree with me on that, but that's just kind of my position. Yeah, so uh, Black Tuesday Films, um yeah, I, 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 I agree with Adam on that, right? So I believe there are there are situations where violent protests or even violent revolt would uh, be justified. Uh, I do not believe we're we're in that situation uh, right now. So the, the the points I was the points I was making earlier is that when you see someone taking a knee or protesting or something like that, based on the ideals of the founding fathers, this could have turned out much worse. And people could have had a violent reaction and been justified, according to according to uh, the founding fathers of, of this country. Right. You could have said, mm -hmm. hey, we're massively oppressed here and we're sick of it. And we're, we're not we want to see blood. We want to see blood. That is the only way that is the only way to, to, to deal with this. Um, now, I will, I'm going to throw this at you, too. I mean, this is something I was thinking about while you're talking. So I think one thing that makes our era era more complex than say you know like the 1960s and so forth is I do think that uh, both in the white community and the black community I, I think there's more diversity in terms of ideologies and I, I don't take that to necessarily be a good thing. So what I mean by not that according is, to Biden, well, <laughs> <laughs> it's in the la it's in the white community and the Latino community. Right, right, there's right. diversity, but come on, <laughs> right, right? That's good. That's good. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't get me started on Biden, man. That, that's a wild dude, you know. But if you ain't, if you don't vote for him, you ain't black. And if you don't vote for Trump, you're not a Christian, apparently, according to John MacArthur. So it's it's we're in a weird place right now. But anyway, so you know, it, it's not to say that, like, of course, you had like uh, you know W. E. B. Du Bois versus Booker T. Washington, and you have Malcolm, and they had you know different ideas than M. L. K. I'm not saying that back in the day they were a monolith. But I do think that nowadays there is a, a type of ideological diversity and situational. And what I mean by that is back in the 60s, I don't care if you was a, a plumber, a doctor or whatever, you lived in the same neighborhood if you was black. That, that, it wasn't an option. You know, what I'm saying? You, you know the, the lawyer lived next to the, the person that cleaned homes. That's how it was. My grandfather, you know what I'm saying, who worked in, um, in the government for years, he actually knew Charles Drew's brother you know anybody knows charles drew is the guy with the blood transfusion and all kinds of really famous doctor guy and they you know lived in proximity to one another because you didn't have a choice back then but now people have options you know they can live where they want to live essentially you know what i'm saying and so black people's experience and where they are economically where they are politically is not as homogenized homogenous today 
as it was back then because they they live in different there's different class you know considerations and stuff like that everybody's not in the same spot and so then you throw different religions and, and perspectives in there as well it's just not the same and so i think that's actually more dangerous in the sense that it's more difficult to find somebody who can kind of cut through that with a voice of reason in a way that really galvanizes people and gets them on the right page i think that's a real problem you know and it's the same way you know in the white community you got and you know you got the alt right, but then you got Antifa. You know, I mean, I, you know, these them cats is crazy, man. I mean, they, they're really out here wild, and and they're kind of in the mix no matter what's going on. You know, it's not just a bunch of black people rioting or whatever. You got these Antifa folks, you know, and out here stirring stuff up, which stirs the pot up even more. So we got a lot of dynamics. It, it's not real. It, it's the, the the waters are real muddy right now, and I think we really need people who are biblically minded and logical to kind of pierce through the darkness, if you will, um, for good. You know, that, that's that's what I'm seeing. Um, here's a comment from David Hawk. Okay. This would be, uh, something we encounter frequently. David Hawk says, it's not true. Black Lives Matter is based on a lie. There's no statistical data to support the anti-police narrative. So I mean, if you, if you were talking about Black Lives Matter, the radical Marxist political ideology, I would say, yeah, that's, that's, that's based on a lie. Um, but now it sounds like he's just... Uh, responding to the idea, the idea that there's a problem with police, so might okay. be a, might, might be interesting. But it, it, I, I know, I've noticed a lot of a lot of people. They tend to let me put it this way: the response to hey, you know, uh, uh, you know, certain communities have problems with police and things like that is uh well you look right. at you look at the statistics well statistically this number of black people were killed by cops last year and this number of white people were killed by cops and uh it's not tremendously different in fact you know given you know given the crime rates actually a little more common seems like a little more common to shoot a white person because cops are actually seem to be getting a little nervous about shooting a, a black person and so the data is just the data is just not there Whereas yeah. um, that's kind of not the not the real issue. That's the that's the one that gets the most attention, right? But let, let, let me let me just let yeah, me just yeah. say, I, I I I noticed this when I was when I was a teenager. I noticed that I reacted very differently around cops than my black friends did, right? <laughs> there, there was there was a, there was a time. I mean, we we were kids and we had a we had we had a. a like BB guns, handguns, but they looked they looked real. If you were not looking real close to it, they, they looked real. Yeah, yeah, gotcha, and yeah. so we had we had them we had them out in the front yard and stuff like that and stuff. We we're you know we we're but it had like working action and stuff on it, so the stuff looked real. Anyway, then we then we went in in my house and apparently neighbor saw us and called the cops because all of a sudden we see like cops coming up the driveway through the window and stuff like this, and uh, I, I'm, <laughs> it was it was me yeah, it, it was yeah. me and either three or four black friends and i noticed all of them just immediately dropped their stuff and went up against went up against the wall like this and i'm sitting there going what they're not going to shoot a bunch of bunch of kids here man right and so the cops uh, act, yeah. the cop the cops actually just just come up in there and, we, and they're like we heard we heard a we heard a report of guns and i went i walked right over not not even seriously thinking just i i i didn't have any sort of you know concern that i was going to be shot and i go no, come on. I went over and I picked it up. <laughs> I picked it up. I go, this is all it is right here, right? And and everyone <laughs> dudes like, are like Yeah, dudes are like, right? So the point is I'm not I'm not I'm not even I'm not even I'm not even thinking about that sort of thing. Uh but on issues on issues like that, like you and I were you and I were talking the other day. I saw a comedian, I saw a comedian, black comedian, he was talking and he's telling talking to the audience and he goes, Did you know that white people will get out of the car when they're stopped and start talking to the officer? And I was like I saw this. I saw this when I was probably twenty years old. But I was like, I always do that. I always jump. I always jump. I always jump out the car, right? Because right, right. when I was eighteen and nineteen, I got pulled over a lot. So, um, but I would always. He pulls me over, and I jump out, and I go, "What? What? Why are you pulling me over, man?" Right? And he's like, "Get back in the car." I'm like, "Okay, fine. I'll get back in and stuff like that." But black dudes think that what you jumped out of the car, <laughs> right? <laughs> you just want to die, basically. That's, that's what you're telling them. I so, mean, and that's, what are your and that's the reason why. The well, yeah, that's the reason why the joke is funny, because in the black community, it's like, that's just insane. Like, that's unheard of. You don't get out of the car. I mean, from as young as I can remember, before I could drive, years before I could drive, I got the talk that if you're pulled over, you hands on the wheel, don't make any sudden, don't move. Not just sudden movements. Don't move. 
You know what I'm saying? Make sure that the window is pulled down before they get there. Yes, sir. No, sir. The whole nine. You, you get that talk. And so the, the idea of get pulled over and you get out of the car, it's like, man, you, you just want to die. That's that, that's what that is, you know. But I mean, now here, here's my thing, right? In response to this question, which I think is interesting. So if and, and I try to I mean, this is what we do for a living. Like we, we try to understand other people's positions so we can not straw man them and stuff. So I've really thought about this. So if, if I was a white person, right, and I wasn't really familiar with you know what black people experience you know in their communities and i'm turning on the news and i'm hearing things like oh black people are being gunned down and then i go to statistics and i see you know what he quoted that well you know what actually it's not the case that you know all these people are being gunned down and so forth then i would come to the conclusion that this narrative that these people i see on tv is forwarding is false right and i would oppose that that's that's rational if, if that's my data set that i'm working with that's a rational conclusion. Now, if epistemically, what we know is that if you can broaden your data set, right, take other information into account, then you should update your conclusions on the basis of this new information, mm -hmm. if it's legitimate information. Now, for somebody like myself, you know, I'm not, you know, I understand that when we talk about like the killings and all these kind of things, the, the, the real issue is not just, you know, black people being like killed in mass or something like that by white cops. That's not the issue. It's, it's that, there's this spectrum of abuses that people in the black community are familiar with in terms of being at the hands of the police. There's this spectrum of different types of abuses of which being murdered by cops is, of course, the most heinous. You know what I'm saying? But you're not going to turn on the news and see somebody saying, like, you know, a black man was insulted by a police officer today. I mean, that, that, you know, that's, that's not going to make the night in the news. A uh, black man was shoved in a, in a way that wasn't warranted based upon the situation. That's not going to make the nightly news. What will make the nightly news is somebody was killed. Mm -hmm. Right. And so those kind of things kind of like the tip of the iceberg. And what we're saying is, you know what, there's this other stuff of which this is just the most worst. The killings are the most heinous example. But there's a problem here of, of this broad range of, spectrum of, of of abuses. For example, like I don't know anybody. I don't know a black person who either hasn't who, who can't tell you a story about being disrespected by the police or know somebody who has, you know, like for somebody like, you know, my mom is I don't want to give her age, but, you know, she's however old she is. And when she comes home and tells me this really happened, that she was pulled over by a police officer and the officer questions her about whether the car was stolen. You know what I'm saying? This is a grown woman, you know, employed, you know, you worked for the government for years. Right. When my wife comes home and says that the police officer told her she got, they pulled her over and told her, you look like somebody who's doing wrong. You know, you look like a bad person. Right. I mean, you experience that. Or when my brother-in-law, oh, actually, I'll be going over to see him tomorrow. God bless him. He just had a child. Shout out to my man, CJ. You know, when he when he tells me the story about how he gets pulled over by the cops, and the first words out of the cop's mouth wasn't, you know, do you know why I pulled you over? That's what you expect. The first question out of the cop's mouth is, have you paid your child support lately? When you experience these kinds of things, when everybody you know has either experienced something like that or know somebody who has, then it's not, you know, uh, irrational to conclude that there's a problem between the black community and you can say more minorities in general and police officers, right? And that these killings where we're saying, look, we've been telling you all this whole time there's a problem. Now we got it on video, right? It's not irrational to, you know, to say, hey, yo, this we're trying to point to something that's very real here. And so anyway, now I I just gave you know a bunch of anecdotal examples, but there are statistics to back this up. I was shout out to my man Tim Stratton. We had a whole dialogue about this. I was on there and I gave some statistics. There are studies on this. I'm not mm -hmm. I'm not just you know, pulling that out of my butt, you know what I'm saying? People really need to look into that. Expand your data set. Evaluate. Look, look for studies. Just Google it. Go to Google Scholar right now, and you can Google studies on accounts of police officers' interaction with different uh, populations based on race. Do your own research, and you'll and and hopefully you'll be able to update your conclusions. Maybe. Uh, related comment question here from uh, Kaffer Linda Clark, who says, "Is it possible that the talk is liberal propaganda?" <laughs> Is is there is there a talk, Adam? I, I'm, I'm, you know. All right, so let me back up. I, I shouldn't laugh like that because I, I don't know this person, and and I'm sure that I'll, I'll just I'll be charitable and assume that the question is is genuine because I don't know what their experiences are. The reason why I laugh is because in in the black community, um, but before the liberals got a hold of you know the agenda that we're seeing today you know, we had Emmett Till's, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like we, we, we had, you know, we, we had, we've had this protracted period, a uh, period of abuses. You know, I'm talking about protracted chronologically speaking. You know what I'm saying like it's, it's been a part of our experience 
from the time that Africans, you know, enslaved persons left the plantation till now. I mean, but you know, within a generation. I mean, that, shoot, I'm, I think I'm being liberal here, but um, or too broad. But within just a few years of coming off the plantation, there were vagrancy laws. You look up black codes and vagrancy laws that were put in place in the South that would basically allow the system to kind of get, you know, these trumped up charges that would then put African enslaved persons or former African enslaved persons back into a slavery system, but just in the penal system. Like this is <laughs> this is a long standing issue. Right. And so when you have somebody like myself, like, you know, my both of my parents have experienced, you know, my dad's passed on now, but both of my parents parents have experienced they, they lived through the 60s. They don't want to see their son die early, right? And so given their experiences, you know, having lived through seeing their peers getting beaten up and these kind of things, they're going to instruct their kids on ways to not let that happen to you. So son, you know, so I mean, I, I can tell you, like, the talk for me was, look, we can fight stuff out in court. You know what I mean? We, we you know, but we, if you're in a situation, we need you to live to fight another day. That's what we need you to do. So here's how you're going to do that. You're going to sit in the car if they pull you over. You're going to not move and, and, and I'll go through all the steps that I just shared. This is not something that's about, this is not liberal propaganda. These are responses to a shared experience of abuse that has, that has been um, just characteristic of the experiences of African Americans. Now, can I, I'm not saying that every single black person that's ever lived in America has been you know, punched in the face by a cop or something like that. But it's a notable part of our communal experience and it's yielded the kind of response to where we caution our young folks. You know what I'm saying if you encounter the police, you need to be careful. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Yeah, and uh, I'll just add. So Linda Clark here says, uh, "Is it possible that the talk is liberal propaganda?" So a Adam Adam gave some background, and um, if you wanted to give all the benefit of the doubt in the world, right? You could say, "Well, it, it's not. It, it's got nothing to do with racism. It's just about economics." And uh there are just lots of black people who are in a different economic situation than, than lots of white people. So lots of white people aren't familiar with this. Like, uh, so I, I grew up in a West Virginia trailer park. We all had run-ins with a cop. Me, all my brothers, we all had run-ins with the, uh, with the cops. Um, I live in a, uh, I don't live in a West Virginia trailer park anymore. I live in a nicer area. I don't have any interactions with cops. I have zero, mm. zero, intera zero interactions with cops. So now if, if I had, lived here all my life and grown up here. And then I start hearing about what racist, you know, cops are or something like that. Then I, I think, come on, what are you, what are you, what are you talking about? But again, giving as much benefit of the doubt as you can, as much benefit of the doubt as you can. Um, I know for a fact, there are messed up cops who are power tripping yeah. and who will abuse their power. And I pointed this out on my video, uh, in my video I made on, on this topic. Um, it's called, if you haven't seen, it, it's called why, why some people hate cops. And I just shared a bunch of uh, personal uh, experiences, all totally just personal uh, experiences, personal interactions and so on. Um, but j just think about this. So me, my brothers, we're, you know, West Virginia, West Virginia trailer park and stuff like that. If if cops mess with us, cops mess with us and, acts like, and act like jerks toward us, we're not thinking racism because the cops are white and, and we're white, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you are in a black community and the exact same thing happens and you have the sort of experiences of the community stories that have been passed down everyone's heard things about this other experiences that you know you knew this happened to your brother and this happened to your mom and this happened to your dad um it comes it would come across differently right if some white sure. cops uh, if some white cops are being jerks then I see why you, I I would see why you'd say okay this this is uh they're doing it because they they don't have a lot of respect for for black people. So what I'm saying sure. there is that is what I just said that is all factual and that is the most benefit of the doubt I could possibly give, right? Mm -hmm. Mainly mm -hmm. there are cops who are jerks to people. They may be jerks to white people, they may be jerks to 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 black yeah. people. Might come across differently to to, to black people might come across as racist and so on. And so these cops would, would be causing some problems. And so in that situation, you'd say, well, it just seems that it just seems that way to black people. It seems like, you know, these, these cops are, are racist, but I would also point out, you know, that's giving the benefit of the doubt. Notice a racist cop, a racist cop who's being a jerk to black people is indistinguishable from a cop who's just a complete jerk. 
right? Yeah, true. It's, indis- yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, in- it's, 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 it's indistinguishable. Is, right. and to, to give you an example that's more along the lines of what, what we talk about here, imagine a Christian in Pakistan. Right? Imagine a Christian in Pakistan where Christians are massively abused by the people around them. Imagine a police officer just walks up to a Christian and beats the crap out of him and and, and files a, a, a false charges on him, throws him in jail, right? If you're a Christian, if that's a Muslim police officer, you'd be thinking, well, it's it's because it's because I'm Christian, I'm I'm being persecuted, even though it's po- it's possible that that co- that that cop is just a, a, is a Muslim and he's a jerk to everyone, right? It's possible right. that he would do the same thing to a to a fellow Muslim. It's possible that he's just an evil person. It right. would certainly come across. It would certainly come across as. Um, it would certainly come across as a Muslim persecuting a Christian, and you. Can, I don't mm. see how you could blame the Christian for that for that situation. Now, so again, most benefit of the doubt you could possibly give, you just say some cops are jerks, and it comes across as racist. But I, I think the reality right. lies somewhere in between. I think there are there are police who have who are more suspicious of of blacks who don't have as much concern for. Uh, the safety and welfare of of blacks and so on. And I think there are cops who are just jerks, but it comes across as if they're racist because they're jerks. So right, I think right, I think right, I, right. my get I, I I think and I've I, I do have a lot of experience uh, <laughs> in the area <laughs> with, of, with the police the, with the police. And so <laughs> right. I think that's I think that's actually the, that's actually the situation. Well, so let yeah. me throw this at you too. This kind of goes with your point, right? And and it's kind of like I'm thinking about this idea of like uh, procedural knowledge. You know what I'm saying when you're talking about epistemology, it's a form of knowledge of kind of like riding a bicycle, like you kind of the know-how kind of knowledge, right? Now, if you and I let, let's say that you know we're watching a, a basketball game with, with LeBron James, <laughs> I guess hate on LeBron James right now, but I'm, I'm just throwing him out there. So you and I could be watching the game, and you know somebody just you know just rears off and just dunks on a dude, right? We're like, oh, man, that's dope. You know, we're like, we're going off or whatever. Like, we can enjoy that moment. We can understand that you know, we can really enjoy the inter- entertainment aspect of it. But LeBron watching that same film, like, the reason why he he got that dunk off is because the last two times that he came up the court, he did this move. And then his third time, he did this other move. And his teammate picked him off because three games ago, we they, they noticed, you know, watching the tapes. And such and such. Like, he can give, it this, give us this whole analytical breakdown of what we just saw, right? Why? Because he's proficient as a basketball player. Now, when it comes to detecting racism, right? Black people are in a position where they become proficient, not infallible. Let me be clear, not infallible, but you want to be proficient at detecting when somebody may have racial bias against you because that can influence real outcomes for you, right? I don't I don't want to uh, assume you know, that somebody's got my best interest at heart and then, you know, just kind of be blind to real signs that they have an issue with me from a racial standpoint, right? So you develop the ability, you, you look for certain signs. Now, again, this doesn't mean you're infallible, but over time, you become better at it than you previously were. Now, if you live in a community where you aren't, aren't compelled to develop that ability, then you just haven't put it in practice very often. And so you you may miss certain signs that other people might be privy to. So, when you think about situ- like uh, Marat Aubrey, you know, it was a couple months ago, right? You had that situation with Marat Aubrey and Castle, like, oh man, you know, it, it wasn't racist or whatever, and Cass- and you know, black people were like, yeah, no, it's not looking too good. I'm, I'm I'm thinking there's something there, you know. And then lo and behold, during the court trial, the, the GBI officer comes out and says that Travis McMichael stood over Marat Aubrey's dead body, body and called him an effing N word, right? Well, you know, I wasn't surprised, right? I kind of thought there was something that was probably the case. Now, I could have been wrong. I'm not saying I was infallible, but you start to see the signs, right? And you learn that, hey, you know what? When I see these certain signs, I'm going to act accordingly. I'm going to be cautious, right? Other people may not necessarily be in a position where they have to develop that ability. It's not, it's not relevant to them. It's not necessary. But we just have to understand that different communities have different experiences and different things that they are concerned about. And racism, it just happens to be one for the black community. We, we kind of uh, are placed in a position where we, we want to detect those kind of things to avoid situations that, that could be negative for us. That's, that's the reality. You know? mm-hmm. um, comment here. So Tony9419 says, what's all this woke business? Uh, yeah. Black Lives Matter is a demonic Marxist organization. If us people of color can't see that, then we have so much bias that we can't see the truth. The BLM stuff is very embarrassing now. Um, mm. Just let me come in, because we've we've been talking a lot about this. Let me try and state it again to be 
as clear as possible. Yes, Black Lives Matter, the Marxist organization, uh, with its stated goal of destroying the nuclear family and abolishing police mm. and abolishing jails and prison, I, I view the, the leaders of that as uh, not necessarily lunatics, um, but very, 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 very out of whack with what almost anyone, what almost anyone out there would agree with. In other words, if you if you state yeah. if you state what they are after to the population of America, you're talking ninety nine point something percent are going to be like, this is insane. This is insane. Yeah. These these positions. How are they? How are they so popular? That's kind of what we're trying to t what we're trying to tell tell you, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So let me let again. Let me try and say this as clearly as possible. You have, and Adam, you can you can you can add to all of this. Yeah, yeah. You have, um, you have a lot of underlying resentment, and when that resentment tries starts rising to the surface over something, right? Something acts as a kind of trigger, as a match, right? And then and then mm. something comes out, right? The response from a lot of people is, stop your whining. Oh my goodness. It's all an illusion. It's all in your mind. You're a bunch of idiots. Come on, shut up. Right? That that yeah. response comes, right? Yeah. And then they'll they'll you'll find people who respond and then say, Yes, I mean, gosh, just look at the statistics. Look at the number, look at the number of uh black unarmed black people who are killed by police and the number of unarmed white people who are killed by police. You see, it's all an illusion. Right? Right, 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 right. And then so that's the response. In other words, I don't really care about anything you're telling me. I view you as a bunch of deluded morons. Stop whining. Right. Shut up. Stop whining. I right. don't care. Right. Well, who 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 actually cares? But let me put it this way. Who seems like they care? Well, this radical Marxist organization that's rallying. We, we're the ones who will, who will help you. Right. So so that that's one side. On the other side, you have you have uh, Adam here who. Hey, wait a minute. I know from personal experiences and from the personal experiences of everyone around me that this isn't this isn't simply an illusion. It can be part illusion, right? Because people can people can always hype things up. I mean, let, sure, let, let, let me, yeah, let me let me give you an example. Okay. I was uh, I was in a subway tunnel one day. <laughs> I was in a subway tunnel one day, and it's after the the garbage train had come through. There's a there's a there's a there's a subway car that goes through and picks up all the garbage, right? And they had dumped it all uh, on this uh, on this platform that was beside me. I was the only one. I was down like I was down like several stories and stuff like this. One of the deep ones, and there's a pile of garbage. I'm the only one down there, and I see this pile. I see this massive mountain of garbage, and it's moving, right? And I'm like. What the heck is going on over there? That's, that's probably not good, right? Yeah, yeah I, I I go down there, so I go down there to take a closer look, and it's just filled with rats, right? The rats understand. The rats understand. Hey, this is where this is where it eats. So the whole this whole thing, it looks like a moving mountain of garbage with rats crawling all over it. But rats are all inside the bags yeah, and stuff yeah, like this. So yeah, it's it's yeah. it's a real disgusting it's a real disgusting thing. Now, I could I could take a bunch of footage of that, and I could let let's just imagine that the media did nothing but put that all over the news for the next for the next year. And that's all they showed was footage of, of rats. Well, you could magnify the problem. But notice, it is a problem. There's a problem there. If I say, right, hey, that's, right. that's, that, if I say, there's no problem with all these, there's a mountain of rats down here, right? right. If, I say there's, if I say there's nothing wrong, there is, a, there is a problem. You could magnify it and blow it out of proportion or something like that. Of, of, of course you can, right? But people, a lot of people seem convinced there are only two options. Either there's no problem, it's all an illusion, or we need to burn the entire country down uh, because it's so, it's, it's so bad. And so right, 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 what, right, right. What, what we're trying, yes, things can be, things can be blown out of proportion. Things That's can possible. be exaggerated. People can take advantage of situations and it's in their, it's in the best interest of the people who are taking advantage of it to magnify these things and to make it seem as bad as possible. Those sort of things can happen. But to say, you know, well, I, I looked at the number of deaths and they're the same. Therefore, you're totally insane. You're just, Adam, Adam, you're just insane. That's what, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, what, that's what we're dealing with right now. I mean, and you're right. I mean, I think, but this goes back to what you're saying before, where I think nuance isn't really valued today. Like it's, it's kind of like all or nothing. It's that polarization thing. These people jump to these extremes. But you're kind of getting back to the question, though. Um, you know, dealing with BLM. Now, let, let me preface this by saying that this this is Adam Coleman speaking. I've got low key beef with every black influencer or intellectual out there 
who is not promoting something that is thoroughly biblical and logical. That's that's me. I, I don't care if it's somebody that's on the left, on the right, or whatever. If you've got a public platform and you're pushing something to the black community that isn't thoroughly biblical and logical, I've got beef with you. You know what I'm saying? So th- that's off top. In that vein, you know, when it comes to Black Lives Matter specifically, you talked about like their, their statement in terms of what they're about and all this kind of stuff, destabilizing the nuclear family, so on and so forth. Interestingly enough, within like the last week, week and a half, they actually took that off of their website. Now, I don't believe it's because they've had a change of heart as an organization. I think they recognize that if they're going to market themselves to the black community, they want to try to make themselves as, as, you know, not objectionable as possible. So I think they're trying to hide their hands, so to speak. But as an organization, uh, you know, certainly I, I don't you know stand by them in terms of, you know, their 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 list of belief statements and so forth. Right. But for me, you know, when I even though I vehemently disagree, I, I mean, I'm not a Marxist. <laughs> Let me just make that clear. I'm not a Marxist. I, I don't rock with cultural Marxism, whatever, whatever other label you want to throw out there. That, that's not Adam Coleman. I'm calling people back to a biblical reality and saying we need to live that out. We need to do, do justice as the Bible says. Now, along those lines, I do think it's important that if, if Black Lives Matter is not only as heinous as it is, you know, in terms of it's what we believe statements, but also um, at the same time, you've got this centralized statement of Black Lives Matter. Like, why not investigate? What is it about that statement that resonates with so many people? All right. You know, we know the organization is, 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 is not standing for what, you know, folks are even in the black community. You know, black community is traditionally more conservative than what Black Lives Matter is. What is it about this statement that resonates with so many people that people are willing to, you know, just kind of look aside from all this other stuff and say, man, I really rock with that. That's what we really got to deal with. From my perspective, really what needs to happen, and I think this is what you're alluding to, the reason why these organizations like Black Lives Matter, and it's not just Black, I mean, Antifa, whatever, the reason why these groups can flourish the way they do is because the church, Christians, I'll say, has have abdicated their position in the public square, right? Nobody should be louder for justice than God's people. <laughs> like no, in, in any context, no nobody should be louder for love, justice, equality, treating people fairly. Nobody should be louder for those things than Christians. But mm-hmm. when we abdicate, when we when we abandon our position in the public square being a voice for those kinds of things, then we create a vacuum that allows for other folks who are going to handle these things in in a, a in a way that doesn't align with the biblical worldview. And then we sit back and complain about it. Oh man, you know, they're doing this, they're doing that. Okay, cool. You know what? The best way, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you guys a cheat code right here for all my video games fans, right? Remember remember Game Genie back in the day? You plug that thing in the car. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of maybe dating myself a little bit. I had the 8-bit Nintendo. You know what I mean? But back in the day, you had the Game Genie. I had Genie. the 8-bit. Okay, there we go. You know, you can put in the code and get like infinite lives. I'm, I'm going to give you all the cheat code to destroying what? Black Lives Matter right now. You ready? Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A, start. A, B, A, B, you, you were close. I think it's A, B, A, B, so hang on, start. Hang on, up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right. Yeah, we were talking about contra. All right, we're going to have to see who's contra, right. Yeah. On. Okay. You, you got to run a poll. Like, who's right? Is it, a, is it B, A, B, A, or A, B, A, B? Select start. You got to select start, right? You know what I'm yeah. saying? All right, so, so here it is, right? I'm going to give everybody in the chat the cheat code to destroying Black Lives Matter. Here's what you do. Create an organization that is biblically based, logically consistent, and go harder than Black Lives Matter ever could for justice in the public square, such that you replace Black Lives Matter with something that looks like Jesus. That's how you destroy Black Lives Matter. You're not going to get rid of it by sitting back critiquing it. That's not, that's not going to work. We know that's not going to work because people critique it all day long. If you want to get rid of Black Lives Matter, replace it that's what we need to do and i'm all with that i'm saying mm-hmm. replace it with something that aligns with the biblical worldview that's yeah. it right there yeah and kind of what we're pointing out is you need to do something like that because if you absolutely if you just if you just deny that anything's going on other people are going to to deal with it for you in a way that you really really don't want because right. you can have a that's a that's a characteristic of a fringe group right mm-hmm. so if you're a white supremacist group right if you were a white supremacist group well most people aren't going to want to get on board with you so if you wanted to gain traction you have to attach yourself to some cause that that people believe in and portray yourselves as the as the champions of that same thing if you if you had the views that that black lives matter the the political marxist organization has no (laughs) one's going to be on board with you so you have to you have to go you the only way you can survive and thrive 
is by latching on to to something else. And uh, I'm gonna be real. Let me just say this: I'm, I, I keep it 100 wherever I go. My my rule of thumb is wherever platform I'm on, I'm gonna keep the same energy regardless, right? Now the reality is this: I'm I'm, I'm just be real, okay? I wish it wasn't the case that one or some of the leaders from Black Lives Matter came out and said that they were trained Marxists. I really wish it were the case that they had this proposition Black Lives Matter that I could get behind, this list of tenets that I could get behind, and their leadership was was right thinking. I wish that was the case. And it pains me to say, it's like, man, I, I, I have to begrudgingly admit, daggone it, man. A, a lot of folks were saying that this, you know, that you got Marxism in the midst and all that. Now, I think a lot of times it's overblown, but in the specific case of those leaders, Obviously, they've been influenced by Marxism. That's undeniable. That's that's the facts. Now, I happen to think that the terms cultural Marxism and Marxism get thrown around far too often. But in this specific case, that's what it is. Therefore, if I'm going to be real, like, look, I, I can't support Marxism. You know what I'm saying in, in its entirety. Now, I think there are certain. I'm, I'm getting get myself in trouble. Oh, I think yeah. all. I think all uh, world, all man-made systems are are flawed, and therefore there are certain Marxist, you know, critiques that flow from the Marxist ideology against capitalism that bear themselves out. They, they really are real. But I think you can say that without you know, imbibing Marxism in total. I just, I just totally lost like 50, 50 subscribers right there. No, no, but, you're, you're, you know. <laughs> just to, uh, just to uh, f- for the sake of solidarity, he's right. Uh, uh, I, I believe capitalism is, is insanely superior to, uh, to Marxism. But ca- it's known that, that capitalism is going to lead to uh, certain things like massive wealth inequality and so on like that right sure, and, and that's sure. that's that's just a feature of it it has right. all sorts of benefits it has all sorts of benefits which make it superior to marxism but that's something sure. that marxism will latch on to marxists will latch on. Right, look at that right. why does that guy have a hundred billion dollars and you're struggling to survive that's not fair therefore let's ignore the the good the, the good features of that system and burn right. it down and and take this system which will is supposedly going to do away with that inequality Although it's gonna, you know, destroy your entire country, but uh, so, <laughs> right, right, so, right, yeah, that's sort of well, thing. yeah, and it's the thing. If if you love America, right, mm-hmm. then what you then what you want to do is you want to take whatever, like like capitalism. We'll stick with that example. You want to, you know, be the best of whatever it is that we can be. So you're gonna say, you know what? If there is some sort of critique that you know Marx or whoever else is, that flows from that tradition levies against capitalism that just happens to be accurate, then. And it, it, just for the sake of being intellectually honest, then what I want to do is I want to take that criticism head on and see how I can improve my system or at least account for it within this larger framework. That's what you want to do, because then you make yourself better, even if you never you know, concede the entire, you know, just to Marxism entirely. Hopefully you won't. But, you know, make your system better. Don't just say, oh, no, nah, just a Marxist. You know, just, you know, no, examine it. Examine, you know, the, the critiques and take them seriously. That's how you become a better person. That's how you become a better community, a better society. Right. Mm-hmm. I just cost you like 500 subscribers right there, bro. Adam Goldman's a Marxist. Just David Wood is a Marxist. Just just doing. <laughs> you, you think I'd do this live stream if I didn't if I wasn't willing to get in trouble? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, oh, oh, a couple couple more comments here. So David Hawk said. Uh, so this is going back to what we were talking about earlier when we're you were you were talking about personal experiences and so on like that. And David Hawk says empirical data or personal experience. Uh, David awesome. Hawk, personal experience is empirical data. Empir- right. em- empirical means it's actually based on observation and experience and not just something you figure out in your head. Like you could, in theory, f- just figure out mathematics in your head, right? You don't need to go out and look into the world and say, oh, I'm actually going to add up water bottles. Um, you could just do it and you can, you can, you could just deal with the concepts in your head. Your personal s- experience is part of the data that you have. That's part of the empirical data then that you're working with. So someone like Adam... All the experiences he's heard about, all the everything he's been through, that's all empirical data for him, right? I might not have access to the same empirical data. I'm, I have different empirical data. But one of the ongoing problems is just, no, based on all the experience I have, that person's wrong. <laughs> right. Well, you might right. want to see what data that person's working with before you, before you, uh, you, know, you, you tell him that he's wrong. Well, I mean, you're right. So, so I mean, for, I mean, that's a false dichotomy. Number one, you're right. I mean, because you know, all your your empirical data, at least in some some studies, is going to be a systematized representation of people's personal experiences. You know what I'm saying that's why, like, any sort of like qualitative studies and things like that, that's what that is. But aside from that, 
Um, I don't know why I feel like I've been talking about epistemology all night, but you know, from an epistemological standpoint, there are different types of information that justify a belief or, or a proposition, right? Um, so, for, so perfect example, right? I don't have any empirical data that David Wood specifically is not a racist. You know I'm saying, but I can justifiably say that I know that David Wood is not a racist. You know what I'm saying because I've eaten with this man. I've you know you know we hung out, been to his home. You know what I'm saying I've seen him interact with people. I have all this personal experience with David Wood. You know what I'm saying? Now, he might shut this live off, and for all I know, I don't, he, he might have a, a Klan uniform hanging up behind him right now. I don't know. <laughs> I actually do have a, I do have a Klan uniform that I use oh, for videos. <laughs> oh, I you use them for videos, right. You, know. you don't remember Muhammad meets a Klansman? That's right. That's right. That's right. I forgot about it with the, with the taters and with that. But, um, but yeah, so, you know, I, so I've got personal experience that lets me know that David Wood is not a racist. Even though I don't have empirical, I haven't done some sort of study. Right. Anyway, I'm kind of belaboring the point, but the, the bottom line is there are we, we function off of experiential data all the time. Mm -hmm. Nobody lives their life on statistical data alone. It's, it's literally impossible. Nobody does that. And so we need to take various. Now, it's not to say that statistical data isn't isn't valuable. It's just we have to understand that it can be taken on balance with various different forms of data that are all, all of which are valuable. Right. Uh, Aranis the ninth said, I don't know. David is very white. <laughs> that could be the only data anyone needs. <laughs> right. Oh man. Uh, Somebody, oh, hello. Said MDR, MDR said, "Name me one perfect country, just one." Of course I, not. I, maybe, I don't know if they responded to us, but I, I mean, yeah, no. I, I mean, yeah, nobody. I don't. I mean, I, I don't think there is one. I don't think there ever has been one. No. Right. J j he, he, just to clarify, I believe the United States is the greatest nation that has ever existed. Um, hmm. I believe that other nations could be greater in certain ways. In certain right. in certain ways, this way or that way, um, and and I and you know depending on what criteria you use, I, I can see making arguments for uh, for other places. I'm just saying on the on the, on the criteria, uh, on on the criteria I I would use. Uh, yep, I, I put us right up there. So this isn't we're not talking about we're not talking about being uh, being perfect. Um, yeah, and, and my, from my perspective, I mean I, I've I've traveled a good amount. I mean I've I've been you know overseas. I've been to different places and. Um, if I was going to leave, I'm telling you right now, I would, I would have been out already. Yep. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm here for a reason. Mm -hmm. You know, with that being said, I, I really take seriously the, the biblical caution that we should not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. Mm -hmm. I'm saying I don't, I don't care. And I would say that if we want to put it in a different context, I would say that ethnically, racially, whatever, however you want to apply that, no, no individual or group should think more highly of themselves than they ought to think. We ought to always be submitting ourselves to the standard of Scripture. I'm saying God's moral nature, you know, even more fundamentally. That's what we ought to be doing. So, yeah, no, all, all of our righteousness is as, is as filthy rags. With that being said, you know, in any given context, I think that Christians ought to always be po pointing to the biblical reality of God's holiness. We ought to always be pointing to the virtues that are, you know, in, just impressed upon us, you know, being that we're made in the Imago Dei, you know, by general revelation, and then expressed in God's special revelation. We ought to always be doing that, we, no matter how good this country gets. Mm -hmm. I hope it gets better. I want America to be great. I mean, I live here. I got I got four kids that I'm raising here. I, I don't want to see America fail, mm -hmm. right? But the best way to bring that about is, you know, I, I, I'll give a personal example. You know, and this is something that David Wood, I think, can relate to. So, you know, I, sometimes everybody knows I'm kind of up and coming with my whole YouTube thing, right? I'm trying to get my, trying to get my life right on this on this on these in these YouTube streets, right? David Wood will tell me in a heartbeat. Hey man, that you that that thumbnail you put out sucks. <laughs> your, yes, your lines I, are not, yes, I do. <laughs> right, your thumbnails are garbage. This is exactly how he says it. Now I know his intentions. I know he does. He's not trying to you know like crush my spirits and you know kick me out of YouTube world. He's telling me this so I can get better, right? And this goes back to what you're saying about intentions. You know what I'm saying? Like his intention is for me to, to not be garbage at my thumbnails, mm -hmm. and so then I'm gonna step my game up. It's the same way with America. You know what I'm saying? If I critique America, it's not because I want to see it burn to the ground. It's because I take the Bible seriously. And I know that the best way for America to thrive is to approximate itself as closely as possible to the biblical worldview and all the virtues and ethics thereof. That's what this is about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A uh, couple more comments. But by the way, everyone, uh, our, our intention was to talk primarily about woke sports, about, you know, yeah. the stuff going on yeah. in the NBA 
and the NFL and stuff like that. And we had all these video clips pulled up. <laughs> yeah, nowhere near. <laughs> we, 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 we didn't come. Near, we didn't come anywhere near. Maybe, maybe, maybe if something if something jumps off, like if, if something happens, then we've we've got video clips pulled up, and we can always. Uh, you know, we can always jump on again. Uh, David Hawk said, uh, good point, David. My concern is just regarding whether we should legislate based off of anecdotal personal experience or something that can be verifiable. Um, yeah, well, to be to be clear, I wasn't even talking about legislating. I'm just saying when when, let's say, Adam is knows from experience hey cop pulled him over and said did you pay your child support what what the heck right what the heck (laughs) right 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 when you have a bunch of experiences like that and a bunch of people that adam knows and trusts have all shared these experiences and he has no reason to think up my mom's making up that story my wife's making up that she was bored so she came home and made up that story he has perfectly perfectly good reason uh, to to believe these things, then when someone says when 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 someone says to him, ah, come on, stop, yeah, come on, it's it's all an illusion, it's all an illusion. Liberals have convinced you that there are these really liberals convinced <laughs> me that my that you know my wife said this and my mom really seriously. That's what happened, right? right. Yeah, it, it just seems to be there's there's a it's all an illusion or. Or again, burn the country to the ground, right? And it's right, right. Uh, again, we're, we're we're we keep repeating the same thing. It's there, there is underlying resentment. Now, some of it may be based on again exaggeration, blowing things out of proportion, things like that. Okay. Some of it's not. Some of it is. Right. Some of it is completely real. And when you ignore or minimize it. Right. So notice there are people who are amplifying it for their political agendas and so on. But when you minimize it or pretend it's not there, uh, you're you're just you're just making way for someone else to to take advantage of it. Yeah. And, and that's the thing Like we talked about with, with with the resentment, for example, like if you are a part of a community who till I mean, man, it's just a part of the communal experience to have your value denigrated on the basis of your skin and the people group that you belong to. If you're a part of that community and you and there are these agents of the state who are in your community who are acting things out that seem to be in accord with furthering that denigration of your personhood and value yeah of course you're gonna you're gonna resent those people you know what i'm saying now we can talk about what's the right way to respond and things of that nature i think there's a way there's ways to respond but we have to understand that that brokenness breeds more brokenness that's what happens right and the question is now to to your point david like we don't want to Deni- we don't want to be in denial. What we want to do is be responsible and responsive. Now, actually, I'm going to say this, though, to, to kind of help the guy out who mentioned about the legislation. I think what a responsible society should do is to say, hey, if we've got a group of people who are reporting X, then what we want to do is we want to investigate X. Right. We want to we want to look into it. And that might involve certain types of studies where we can you know, bring together uh, certain quantifiable data. And, you know, what he, well, he used the word verifiable. I think he's mistaken on that because personal experiences are verifiable, but I'll just say quantifiable, right? You know, yeah, that can be a tool for gaining better understanding as to what's being reported. And then maybe that data will support what's being reported. Maybe it won't, but you at least want to look into it. And then that can be a tool that may inform how you go about legislation. But what you don't want to do is say that, oh, personal experiences, eh, you know, we ain't really trying to hear that. That's not a responsible way to, to respond to uh, any people, group, regardless of what, what, what the concerns are. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Jeffrey Klein here says, uh, but and he said this significantly earlier um, when we're talking about issues with, uh, you know, that, that certain people have with police and so on. Jeffrey Klein says, but is it systemic? Is it systemic? And mm. I'd say I I would say there's no question that certain problems are systemic. It's just a question of to what extent and. Notice that for something to be systemic, it doesn't have to be in the entire country. It could be in an area or something like that. Could be, yeah. But uh, I, I would say no question. What's what's amazing to me is almost everyone seems to get this idea when it's not something that's talking about <laughs> race relations, right? Like <laughs> I'm currently at war with eBay. Why am I at war with eBay? Well, I I put an item up for auction and they said that could be offensive to Muslims and they took it down. They will not allow on their platform anything that could 
possibly offend a Muslim. You go on there. I went through the, the items on there. They have tons of the, the piss Christ uh, items, which has a, an image of Jesus soaking in urine. They have things that say uh, shirts. That you can buy shirts that say uh, Satan sucks, Jesus swallows. You can have, wow. uh, they have shirts for sale, which uh, talk about Christians being food for lions. And you oh, can bring man. this up. They, they, they just leave it up there. So notice. Right. That's a systemic problem, right? That's not that's not some individual specific thing. They got a problem in their system, right? Right. And right. you and what 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 what's funny is conservatives get this all they understand this about Twitter and Facebook and so on. <laughs> Wait a minute. They're targeting me and they're not targeting They've even done experiments where they'll they'll post a comment, you know, at and say it's for the sake of one political ideology. They'll post the same comment and say it's for another. One will get banned, the other won't. There's a problem. There's a problem in the system. Problem, Why would right. you not think that in certain areas of the United States they could actually have problems? And in my video, in my video, um, why some people hate cops, I, I pointed out a problem where um, up in West Virginia, um, my brother got charged with um, having a gun, uh, no, having multiple guns in a house where he was just renting a room, right? He's renting a room. The owner of the house has guns in the house and they're in a gun safe. My brother has no access to them, has no idea they're there. He rented a room from the guy and it's actually in the law. It's in the law that if there are guns anywhere in the house of, a, of, of someone on parole, that you can, you can charge him for all this stuff. Now, wow. now notice, so it's in the law. It's in the law. It's in the law that you can charge someone. So it's perfectly it's perfectly in accordance with the law to charge him, even mm. if he's someone who had no clue that they're there. He had nothing to do with it. He had no idea, and he's just renting a room. So right, right. that this this is not to point out that there's a uh, an issue of race here. To point out that's a problem in the system. That isn't a cop made a mistake. Like a jerk cop made up something, right? Right. There's right, a problem right. in the system with that, right? right. That, in, in other words, that the system is producing a kind of injustice. If you lock my brother up for something he did, no problem. Lock him up. When he's like, I had no idea. I, I didn't know that this was a rule. I didn't know that this guy had guns. I had no idea. And you charge him with it anyway. I say, that's a problem with the system. So I don't yeah. know why when someone says, there's a systemic problem here. Uh, there's a systemic problem I don't know why people flip out about that. We see them all around us. Anytime there's a right. there's a system in place that is screwing one group over another, okay, we, we we get that idea. So why you know the question should be you know what evidence do you have of a systemic problem in in that particular area? But we should all be open to the ideas of yeah, a, of course, of a yeah, systemic I mean, problem. Right. I mean, sin is systemic. <laughs> you know what I'm saying yeah. like what, like one way yeah. or the other. I mean, that's just how it is. But I mean, I, I think that. And I, I don't. I'm not going to put this. I don't know the person who asked this question, but you know, in terms of how I encountered it in the past, it seems to be that some people were like, "All right, you know what? Personal racism. That's kind of an easy bar to meet. Obviously, there's racists out here. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's not hard to to, to fathom. You know I'm saying so. I feel like there are some people who want to up the ante, but basically raise the bar and say, "Okay, well, I'm going to make the argument about systemic racism. You know what I'm saying let's let's make it about that because they believe." That there's no good, you know, evidence for systemic racism, and so they're trying to set the bar high, high to kind of tilt the conversation about race in a particular way. Now, with that being said, with that being said, I do think that many times when people argue argue for the existence of systemic racism or, or that there is systemic racism, I do think some of those arguments are weak. I'm not saying that systemic racism doesn't exist, but I think on both sides of the coin, I think better arguments need to be made. Now, um, when it comes to I mean, I don't, maybe I don't want to go too far on that because I, I think it will take the whole show. But um, I think that there are certainly instances in which the system, you know, even if it's in a locality, is harnessed in a certain way that it disproportionately Im negatively impacts minorities. Perfect example. I was uh, I, I'm trying to think if I can say this or not, but um, I, I used to take certain um, I had a job. <laughs> I'll just put it that. I'll try to be vague as possible. I had this one job where my role was to teach kids, uh, basically, kind of how the court system works because they've been found as possibly being incompetent to stand trial. So I had to teach them the, the system, and if they were able to pass the exam, then they would stand trial. If they didn't, then they would be declared incompetent. So that was my role was to kind of teach them how court works and so on and so forth. So I had to go to training for that. And so in one of the trainings, we're sitting there now. Mind you, this guy was from was from the state. He was was conducting this training. And he's kind of going over the difference, the differences uh, between felonies and misdemeanors in, in the case of juveniles and how they're treated. Now, long story short, he just starts etching out. I was like, yeah, you know, I've got, you know, there's this list of offenses right here. There are nonviolent offenses 
that if somebody commits these that are underage, once they commit this charge, if it's a felony, then no matter how old they are for subsequent charges, they will always be charged as an adult. And he says, man, you know, it's kind of weird. Now, this is, the, this is the trainer from the state, right? So he said, you know, actually, it's kind of weird when you think about it, because if you look at these charges, it seems like African-Americans would be predisposed to being kicked into the uh, being charged as adults much earlier on average, you know, than th these other groups, because that's where these nonviolent you know, offenses tend to occur. He said that, he's like, man, that's kind of jacked up. And then he goes on with the rest of the training. And mm -hmm. I'm sitting there like I'm on the other side of the phone like, you know, like, like that's crazy. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's super wild that you have this group of people how based upon how the laws are written, they're more likely to end up being prosecuted for other charges as an adult as opposed to some other groups. That's a problem. That's a real problem. That's that's it's a systemic problem. So any given lawyer, any given prosecutor that's pushing for this or that, you know, outcome for that person, it's not their fault. There's a problem with the system. You know what I'm saying? So I kind of was, you know, talking, you know, rambling a little bit, but I just want to say, you know, um, let's on both sides, let's not make assumptions. Investigate. If you feel like there's no systemic injustice, find the best arguments. You know, for systemic injustice, and then and grapple with those. If you feel that there is systemic injustice, injustice uh, racism rather, find the best arguments against your position and grapple with them. That's how you really sharpen your position, not by making assumptions. Yeah. Um, should probably take one or two more and be up out of here. Uh, Daniel, yeah, we're, the we're the worst, man. We had like five video clips and didn't yeah, get we had a bunch of, of video <laughs> clips, and yeah, you didn't get to any of them. You kept you kept talking too much. <laughs> right, right. Hey, look, uh, just real quick, somebody asked a question. It was a while ago. It was a super chat, but they yeah, asked like, on. have either one of us read uh, Thomas Soul and um, or have we watched Larry Elder's uh, Uncle Tom film? The, the Larry Tom, the Larry Elder film, the documentary called Uncle Tom is about black conservatives uh, by a guy named Larry Elder who who is himself a black conservative. I think Candace Owens and a bunch of other folks were in it. It's it's a relatively new film. I've been meaning to watch it. I haven't watched it. I'm not a fan of Larry Elder, but. I do intend to watch it. As far as Thomas Soul, I got books sitting around here right now from Thomas Soul that I'm working my way working my way through. I am familiar with him. I've seen him speak, and I'm actually it's part of my own project uh, personally to kind of just comb through his works because I have uh, certain questions about conclusions that people come to. But um, but to answer the question, yeah, I, I've, I've read some Thomas Soul. Um, maybe we maybe who else should watch it? Hey, maybe you, you, me, John. McCray and Carlton should all watch it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm down for it, man. That'd got, be dope. That'd be, and, and, yeah, yeah then we'll go. Then we'll go. Then we'll go live and and discuss it because, uh, guys, if you don't know why that's funny, it's uh, some of the people on that list are going to have some very, <laughs> very different. It's going to be very different responses. Yeah, it's going to be it's yeah. going to be straight fire. I say, hey, man, look, hey, Carlton is no joke, man. Carl, he, Carlton no is no joke. No. No, no, no. It, that's I just, sharp. I just want to I, see. I, I wouldn't want no smoke with him. I want to see Carlton and John argue over that, though. That would be a. <laughs> you and me just bring popcorn. <laughs> Get your popcorn ready. I'll just sit back and watch, man. Um, um, all right. So, so this comment, th th I, I, this is kind of a. It seems like a specific comment, but it's kind of a. Um, I I put this up because I think it it draws attention to what I was talking about what it means for something to be a systemic problem, right? So uh, Daniel says, isn't it the responsibility of the parolee to notify the homeowner about the firearm rule? I think they give them clear instructions when released on parole about being around guns. Now, Daniel D, I am, in, I am a former parolee. Uh, whatever they told, I, I, uh, they did tell me uh, that I can't have a gun um, and that I, you know, I, they made that clear. Uh, I have no recollection of them telling I can't rent a room for someone in a house and that I have to inform this. So you might be overestimating how clear they are in the rule. So so that's 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 one thing. Right. Um, uh, maybe in certain areas, they are very clear. I can say from personal experience in other areas, they are not very clear at all because I have no recollection of it. And I would not have thought twice about renting a place from someone who has uh, who has a gun. And I wouldn't have known until I got in trouble for it. So that's one issue. Now, problem problem number two. My brother was charged for renting a room from someone else who had a house, and in that house he has a safe where he has some guns. My brother's charged for those guns for those guns that he has no access to because the law allows allows that, right? Now think about this. If you say Adam, Adam, suppose I'm renting a room from you and I'm on parole mm -hmm. and I come up and, and just suppose you have uh, five guns in your in your house in a safe. 
And I, I, I say, and you got a room for rent. And I say, hey, I understand you got a room for rent. Just want you to know I'm a convicted felon. Um, <laughs> I've had gun charges before. And so I, I'm not allowed to be, I mean, uh, yeah. So, or matter of fact, how about this? Uh, hey, I understand you're, you're renting a room. I'm a convicted felon. I was just wondering, um, do you have guns in your house? <laughs> What's your answer going to be, Adam? <laughs> Was going to be, you know, I'm glad you asked. Let me just show you right to the gun safe right here. As a matter of fact, what I don't want you to do is put in this code that opens the safe. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So let me give you the code so you don't put it in. That's what I'm going to do, man. No, obviously, I'm not going to let you in my place. That's, that's what I'm going to do. Like, I'm yeah. Gonna, you know, so, yeah. So, so, so notice, notice um, if you decided, hey, I'm, yes, I'm going to rent a room to this guy. You're not going to tell this guy you have guns. Of course right? not, right. Yeah, you're not going to tell. A convicted felon that you have guns <laughs> that you have guns in your house right you don't right, want right. the convicted felon to know what you have you don't want to do right. you have do you have jewelry too um do you have what <laughs> can, you what do you money? have that a guy can rob right right so the, right. the the point the point is the point is daniel d the point is um best case scenario the the best case scenario the felon understands very clearly i am not allowed to be in a house that has guns he rents he, he goes to rent a room hey sir i would like to rent a room from you but do you have guns and the guy says no i don't have any guns here sir what happens when that uh that uh parolee gets arrested it's not in there oh but if you don't know about it or something it's not in there you can't be in a house with guns that's my point right there's a there's a problem there's a problem in the system Right. There's a there's a problem that that should be addressed. And, and notice this can go to the police, to the prosecuting attorneys, to the judges and the judge will say, yep, that's the law. Bam. You're in trouble. That's, so it. that's just right. how it works. So, yeah. And so the the the, the question, the question. So and anyway, that th those are just examples of problems that are within the system. So the question is, yeah, I want to respond extent. to something, too. Um, yeah, actually, because because somebody asked a question, I think kind of gets at uh is this uh, what we were supposed to be talking about anyway? But um, you know, Billy Mandalay, you know, says uh, million millionaire blacks still whine about systemic racism. How does that work? He's got that in all caps. You know, I kind of want to respond to that because th there's a couple elements there. First of all, th let's be clear. We we want to first and foremost think biblically about all these questions. Okay, that's what we want to do. So when from a biblical standpoint, you know, the wealth of a person you know, is independent upon, you know, uh, from whether or not they've been wronged. I'm saying like, we, we don't evaluate whether somebody has been wronged based upon how much wealth that they have. Right. So if you have it, you can't steal from rich people and be like, oh man, they're rich anyway. So, you know, what are they worried about? That's, that's not biblical. I'm saying if somebody has been defrauded, if somebody has suffered loss unjustifiably, then they've suffered loss unjustifiably. You know, that's, that's how the Bible looks at it. Okay. So, you know, wrong is wrong, basically, no matter who suffered it. That's that's the point there. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, economically, just think about this. Bring it down to America. You know, we talk about tax codes all the time. I don't care whether you're on the left or the right. You know, tax codes is really important to people, right? You know, we want to make sure that people aren't being taxed too heavily or or not. Corporations are really big on this. I'm saying that you know they feel like oh man, you know we're bearing too much of the load. You know, we need to you know shove it down some. Then people at the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum like no, we need to shift it back up. You know, it's kind of like this hot potato between you know the, the classes in terms of who should sh you know sh uh shoulder the you know tax burden more mm -hmm. so well if, ta if it, it's obviously possible that corporations and wealthy people could be at least in principle taking on too much of the tax burden that's in, that's in principle possible and if that's going on then the right thing to do would be to relieve them of that if that were going on right now if you recognize that they were sh shouldering too much of the burden tax wise and you're like ah screw it they, they got enough money they ain't, i ain't worried about it that's obviously unethical. <laughs> You're mm -hmm. obviously imposing upon people uh, more than they ought to be imposed upon. That's wrong, right? So at least on those two levels, you could have somebody who's a millionaire who suffered loss and still has something to say about systemic racism. If they've been wrong, their wealth has nothing to do with it. Lastly, the Bible tells us to love others as we love ourselves. And so if I'm a wealthy millionaire black person, but I know people are suffering in ways that I would not want I myself to suffer, then it's morally right for me. It's biblically right for me to speak up for the poor. That's what the Bible talks, the Bible says, speak up for the oppressed. That's what the Bible says, right? So I wanna be very careful here, you know, that we're thinking biblically and logically through these things, not being swayed by, you know, the narratives of our time. We need to make sure we're kind of cutting through those narratives with a biblical lens and saying, you know, what does thus, thus saith the Lord in terms of what's ethical in this or that situation? Do, you know, and people obviously can have a cause 
to be upset about systemic racism and being wronged in any way, whether they're billionaires or not, millionaires or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Indeed. And uh, last comment here. XYZ says systemic racism, millennial nonsense. Um, there's something going on, XYZ. So uh, l- l- let me let me just give you an example. So I was locked up. Um, was locked up and I was at St. Bride's Correctional Center in Chesapeake, Virginia. And mm. I'd be talking to a person and, and this is just the one that popped into my head, but this sort of thing happened over and over and over and over and over again. Um, was sitting there and uh, talking to someone and, hey, how much time you got? I said, 10 years. Yeah, what'd you do? I smashed a man's head in with a ball peen hammer. How much time you got? 12 years. What'd you do? I was selling drugs. Now, this is, I don't know any, I don't know how to actually defend this, but I believe that standing over someone and bashing his head in with a hammer is, is, is worse than, you know, selling some drugs that people are trying to buy from you. Right. That, that's, mm. that's my perspective. This guy had more time than I did. Right? Mm. And so that sort of thing happened over and over and over and over again. Um, I had a Mexican friend named Lucio Alvarez. Alvarez, Alvarez was locked up for, he, he was here, he was in the country illegally, but that's not what, that's not what he was in jail for. I mean, in prison for. He was in the country illegally, but what he was charged with was malicious wounding. He hit he beat a man's face in too hard. Now, he found this man. He went in his his three sons here in America. Um, he had three sons with an American woman. He had three sons, and he goes into his son's room. His sons are all sleeping, and he goes to put their jackets in a closet. A guy rushes him out of the closet. A crackhead was hiding in his closet. Rushes at him, grabs him. And I used to, I used to, uh, we used to punch each other all the time. We'd stand between two bunks so we could only use straight shots and we'd, we'd hit each other. This guy's, this guy's fists felt like rocks hitting you. Sounds right? like a great, sounds like a great way to pass the time. But yeah, we, yeah, we would do, we would do dumb stuff like that all the time, but, but it was fun. But this guy, a lot of Mexicans take their hand skills, uh, seriously. They grow up boxing and stuff like this. And this guy, this guy, uh, what was that guy's name? Man, I told you, I can't remember names today. And hands of stone. Who's the hands of stone guy? Oh yeah, um, no, nah, I can't remember. Ah, oh, yeah, gosh. So, so he's yeah, he's back in the he's back in the time with uh, with uh, Sugar Ray Leonard and all those guys. But um, yeah, no, ma- no, ma- so, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. He he went when he when he kept sit, sitting down. But um, so I we'd be sitting there hitting each other, and this guy had hands of basically hands of stone, right? So anyway, the charge was he cracked this man's face when he was punching this man in the face that rushed out of his kid's closet. This crack it. Mm-hmm. Right, Duran, Roberto Duran. Yeah, Roberto Duran. They're correct. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, he got so I got seven years for smashing a man's head in with a hammer. This guy got seven years, seven years for hitting a man too hard in the face who came out of his kid's closet. He hit him too hard in the face. That's crazy. That's crazy. Okay, now I just want to say, I can't. Th- th- there's a ton of experience like that. We know a lot of people here are very resistant to experience, but I'm just going to say the entire time I was locked up, there were lots of people in the courts, in the jails and so on. And it just seemed that David, we've got more hope for you than we've had for the people around here, the other people around here. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how it always seemed. So, uh, I, I believe from personal experience, at least in certain areas, that when you're locked up, then it could be it could be other factors. They could have just said, "Well, this David Wood, this David guy is really smart," or something like that. Maybe there, maybe you know, maybe he'll make it when he gets out, or something like that. But mm-hmm. uh, a lot of personal experience told me that. And here, I'm not just I'm not just talking about cops and things like that. I'm talking about it could be from from other no, people, no, I got you. Yeah, the yeah, system yeah. and so on. Uh, it just see. Let me put it this way. There were times when I seemed to be treated better mm. or like there was more hope for me than for other people. And I I think that's a problem. 
Well, that's you know, I'm, I'm, that's deep, man. That's deep, you know. And I, I'm thinking about my experiences as a social worker, you know, dealing with kids, breaking, <laughs> breaking the law. Some of them seem to get a lot more uh, leniency with the courts than others, but I think it's it's been uh, eyebrow raising at times. But let, let, let me say this, man. And I'm probably going to end up having to do a whole show on this because this systemic racism question keeps coming up. And so maybe I, I can't get my full perspective on it now, but just just think about this. And I, I said this to somebody the other day, maybe when we was uh, in North Carolina, but in my family, okay, I am a first generation free African American, and by free I mean that there are no laws on the books, at like you know, on a on a wide scale, that are ostensibly racist. Okay, I'm saying. My parents didn't experience that. Nobody in my family before me was born into a world like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with that being the case, you know, from my perspective, there's I I, I can look at my own family history and I can see lots of you know different uh, things that probably could have gone differently. But from a communal standpoint, you know, it's it's like freedom and equality is new. It's, it's still new for the black community. I, I know that we tend to think that like Jim Crow stuff was like super long ago. It wasn't. I'm saying I had a guy come into my office a couple years ago whose aunt, not great aunt, his aunt was a slave. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know what I mean he was a, he was up in age, you know, and I was work, he was a veteran. Anyway, my whole point is we're not as far removed from slavery, Jim Crow, and these kinds of things as we like to think that we are. Now, with that being said, if let's say if I if I grabbed your arm, right, and I squeeze it as tight as I can to the point where I left a bruise, all right. If I left that, if if I if I let your arm go, the bruise would still be there. I'm saying there were, you would require some treatment. There would, there would take some time to heal. Okay, when it comes to Jim Crow, uh, redlining, uh, you know, hiring disparities, banking practices, a, a whole litany of things, you know, that that has been that have been economic impediments to the black community over time throughout America's history. That that hand just got let go. Not that long ago, mm -hmm. there are still economic bruises, okay, in the black community that are that exist today, and those economic bruises have yielded other kinds of unfortunate effects. I'm saying even down to everything from the quality of schools to family cohesion. You know what I'm saying all of the above have been impacted. Now, I don't think that's you know uh, mutually exclusive to personal agency. Like people have to take responsibility for their choices. But biblically, again, we, we want to think biblically. Biblically, personal responsibility and collective responsibility are not at odds with one another. They actually have a complementary relationship throughout Scripture, right? And so what we want to do is we don't want to hold to a view that, that you know, cancels out one or the other. I said that to say, uh, yeah, there's some economic bruises, and I think the right thing to do for a just society is to address those you know what I'm saying? That can have, reasonable people can disagree in terms of what that means and how they, they go about it. But I think a just society should address um, anything that militates against uh, you know well-being unnecessarily. That's what we ought to be doing. So you know, I'll probably do, do a whole show about that. But that's kind of like a, a sketch of, of kind of where I'm coming from. Yeah, and uh, that's that's another example of a situation where a lot of people would want to say, "Come on." Everyone's got poor people, right? Everyone's got poor people. So enough talk about, you know, the economic problems that, you know, maybe can be traced back to, to known causes and so on. Um, so we're, we're back down to, we're back down to just completely ignore the problem. Don't talk about it. Don't try to find any solutions. Or burn the place to the ground because it's so horrible and unjust. Right. And uh, right. guys are just, <laughs> they're killing me right now. They're, they're telling everybody's saying, just stop voting Democrat. I, I, I mean, I don't know if they're talking to me or what, but um, you know, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I don't know what that's about, but you know, let, let me just clarify. First of all, I, I'm not a Democrat. I, I don't consider myself to be a Republican either. I consider myself to be independent. And my personal view is that really Christians have this, um, this collection of, of values and principles that they ought to guide themselves by that is really best for human flourishing. And neither the Democrats nor Republicans, or if you want to broaden it out, neither liberals nor conservatives 
really have enough space for all the stuff that we have in our bag. So what we what we need to do is really be Christians, live out the biblical ethic, and bring that bag of ethics and principles with us to make the best out of you know whatever side we we, we find ourselves on. But you know I, I'm not I'm not a Democrat, so I'm not exactly sure what, where people are coming from with that. But uh-huh. yeah. Yeah, well, no, I, 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 I told you before, uh, I'll be talking and I, I will hear, uh, I'll get comments from people on one video and it's, uh, I can't believe you're such an idiot, radical Trump supporter, right wing, blah, 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 blah. And then I'll say something in a different video or live stream or something and I'll get, I can't believe you're a social justice warrior, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> David, you sound like a Marxist. And it goes back to what we're saying. See, like you point out, I'm I'm not Republican or Democrat. I would, you know, again on issues like abortion and especially with a lot of the insanity, I'm I'm in a situation where people are pushing me more conservative because everyone everyone on the <laughs> everyone's going so so insane, right? But right, I mean, right. I'm aware of that, and that's why I'm actually taught. That's why I'm actually able to talk about. Hey, guys, you're going to end up in a situation here where everyone on that side says everyone on the opposite side is racist, and they're the saviors. They're going to be the saviors who rescue you from all the racists. And then on the opposite side, it's going to be, um, no, no, no. Everyone on that side is crazy and want to destroy your country and destroy you. And we're your saviors. Um, so we're going to save you from all the all the crazy people. And I just don't want to be manipulated. So what you have is people who, no, I'm a Christian. I'm not just going to go into a camp where I'm lockstep with, with anyone. But notice that because we're 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 not at either extreme again people are moving are going so far so fast that uh yeah. we look like we would look like social justice warriors to people from a certain perspective and sure, sure. and we would look like right wing alt right whatever types from from a from a different perspective and true sure. um so yeah ladies and gentlemen and so we're gonna we're gonna do what we do. We're gonna hold. We're gonna we're we're gonna do the best we can to to stick to our values and and not be manipulated and swayed. Because guys, again, right as this country as this country and as this world moves away from its foundations, all that's going to be left with is rhetoric. All we're gonna be left with is rhetoric and manipulation, right? Mm-hmm. And if you if you if you get into a, a situation where you fall for that. You fall. You, hey, here's my hero, and I'm just going to go along with whatever he says. Uh, you better make sure that that person is actually really, really seeking to do uh, what's in the best interest of of the country and the world, and not just using you. And so, yeah, that's what Hitler did, right? Oh yeah, that's what everyone does. That's yeah. what yeah. everyone does. That's what everyone. That's that's what. Yep, that's what everyone does. That's what tyrants do. All right, Adam, any final thoughts before we sign off? We've gone a long hey, time. Spent almost two and yeah, a half hours. We're killing the game out here, man. Well, yeah, I, 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 I told you before I, I hopped on here, I got me a nice uh, steam pot waiting with crabs and whatnot. I was about to throw in a steam or something. I'm ready to get to that, man. Mm-hmm. I'm saying, hey, you should be here, bro. You can be enjoying it with me, man. You're messing up, bro. you messed it up. Yeah, hey, I got this giant grill. We should, uh, we should, you should bring a crab pot and then, uh, we'll, uh, I'll make the steaks and you make the, the crabs and we'll have, uh, there sur- it is. it's called surf and turf. There it is. There it is, man. You know, <laughs> it sounds good, but no, seriously, man, I mean, I enjoy these kind of conversations, mm-hmm. man. I, mean, I know we'll have more in the future, but you know, th- this is where these discussions should happen. You know what I'm saying amongst Bible minded believers who are sincerely trying to think these through these things through in as logical way as possible. This is where these discussions should happen. You know, this whole time. You know, we've been pointing people back to the biblical ethic. In regards to what you think about us, you know, anything that we've said, just go back over the video. You're saying we're we're pointing people back to scripture. Now, if you don't listen to us, fine. You know, Black Lives Matter is waiting to step in the door and you know say whatever it is they got to say. You're saying <laughs> you you got two believers here who are giving you something you know that is consistent with the biblical framework. So what we need is for Christians to be louder in the public square for the full range of ethics that the Bible calls for. Mm-hmm. That's what we need to see. And by loud, actually, I don't just mean in terms of our voices. I mean in terms of action. Mm-hmm. I'm saying nobody should be outworking us. I'm saying when it comes to seeking justice, nobody should. I'm saying we have the, the highest call towards justice. Nobody should be getting this on that. Mm-hmm. And if and if somebody is, shame on us. We need to correct that. If you want to you know, put a, put a stop to um, the, these other groups and ideologies, the best way to do it is to get in there, get your hands dirty, and replace them with something that's that reflects what God's love and justice is like. That's what we need to be about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and uh, I'll just say, ain't nobody gonna outwork me. <laughs> ain't gonna happen. 
But but guys, uh, <laughs> right. yeah. If you uh, pa Paul Copan does an extra uh, does an awesome presentation on this, where he goes back and examines the the impact Christianity has uh, has had on the world, and mm. um, I'll, 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 I mean abolitionists going against slavery that that's something common that we would think of but everything sure, sure. education system um he, he points out everywhere christianity spread literacy exploded uh women's rights were encouraged every everywhere mm -hmm. it went and stuff and uh, and and he goes on to to talk about um one of the one of the things that really helped the west was a, a protestant work ethic not saying catholics sure. don't but but specifically in in certain areas where the Protestant specific Protestant denominations started emphasizing work as good. Mm -hmm. It's not something to be avoided. It's something. It's something. It's a, like a gift from God to be able to work yeah, hard yeah, sure. and so on. And right. places just kept kept prospering and so on. And um, a lot of a lot of nations right now are kind of running off of the the fumes of that still. Right, they're running off the mm. momentum. In other words, they reached a certain yeah. level of prosperity. It's still, you know, it's still going right now. But you rip out those foundations, things are gonna you're, are gonna start breaking apart. And right now, you see again record polarization, political polarization, ideological polarization. Uh, sides just trying to just end you for saying the wrong thing. People wanting to get violent against you for saying the wrong thing. And yeah, this is this is the time. You Christians, you need to. I, I, you atheists are watching. I know I have atheist viewers. Love you guys and so on. Uh, there are lots of things we uh, we can unite on and so on. But at the end of the day, I do not. I do not believe this this problem that we're facing right now of massive division is going to be solved by anything other than Christians standing up and being the most powerful voice around. That's mm. right my that's my perspective all right I'm into that. well yeah. uh uh adam's information is in the description box uh there's a link to his channel link to his patreon if you want to support him um adam i believe is uh is going to do well on youtube has the right personality for youtube I, I i've told him before you know to do stuff like this you got to be smart got to have a good personality and a good work ethic uh, as far as you know constantly getting it done and so yep i think adam's gonna be blowing up yeah, here man Mm -hmm. Trying to make it happen, brother. Trying to be, you know, the uh, on your level, Doc. I didn't say. I didn't say all that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, gonna, yeah, I'm not. I don't you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna have to go fast to catch me, because uh, right. I got a ten year head start. <laughs> well, I mean, if I start eating the Quran, maybe I can catch up, man. You I, can. You, you got to do something like that. Day, you know. Yeah. I gotta you got to do something like that. Now you're thinking. Now you're thinking. All right, right. All right everyone. Uh, I should have a video up tomorrow, and. Catch y'all next time. Peace.